All righty, good morning. Uh, my name is Donovan Richards, and I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee. We are here with Chair Rory Lansman and the Committee on the Justice System as well. We are hearing two pieces of legislation today, introduction number 1349, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the police department to implement sensitive arrest policies in introduction number 806, a local law in relation to creating an interagency task force to be charged with studying the obstacles faced by children of incarcerated parents from arrest to reunification. I want to begin by thanking the members of the NYPD who are here to testify. We also invited the district attorney's offices, but, it, but I, if I understand correctly, they will not be in attendance, and that's really a shame. I know a couple of them are planning to be here on Wednesday to talk about marijuana legalization, which I believe they do support. But I think they should also be here to talk about practices that we as lawmakers and as an oversight body may, may be somewhat critical of. This hearing was sparked by what happened to Jasmine Headley at an HRA office back in December, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will have some questions about that incident, as do I. Before I move on to the NYPD side of this issue, I have to say that I find it deeply upsetting that after she was put through the trauma of that arrest, a district attorney's office asked for an order of protection, barring Ms. Headley from seeing the son that she was only trying to protect, especially when she was the only one, especially when they didn't really know what happened when they asked for it. Separating parents and children should not be the default and I'm disappointed that none of the DR DAs are here to talk about how and why they make these decisions. I don't want to dwell on that incident just to point fingers. We already had our discipline hearing a few weeks ago, and this hearing is really not about whether to discipline the NYPD officers, who a lot of people saw on video, along with HRA security guards ripping Ms. Headley's son out of her arms while she was on the ground. I have met with Commissioner O'Neill about the incident, and I know his position, and I trust that he thought carefully about his decision not to take disciplinary action against those officers. I strongly disagree with this inclusion, but I want to move on from that today. I want us all to learn from that incident and to move forward and think about how officers will deal with similar situations in the future, and that's what Councilmember Danny Drum's bill is about today. But the NYPD needs to understand that not publicly confronting what happened in that case sends a signal to New Yorkers that according to the NYPD, those actions are acceptable. What I saw is simply never acceptable, and we can't sit back and quietly worry that other officers might see that and believe that was how that situation should have been handled. I know the police officers were there for a long time before that video started, and they really tried to de-escalate the situation and they were not the ones driving it towards what we saw. But we all saw what we saw, and we all need the NYPD to say to us and to say to, these or to their officers that there is a better way, that their standards are higher, that their training teaches them how to avoid what happened that day. From what I understand, that is what we are going to hear, so I look forward to discussing what their training is, what their NYPD's policy is, and most of all, that they support the legislation we are hearing today. Uh, before I turn over to my colleague, uh, co-chair Lansman, and then to Drummond Williams, I just wanted to have a moment of silence uh, for Detective Brian Simonson, who was uh, killed, unfortunately, uh, last week. So if we can have a moment of silence. Thank you. I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Lansman, and then we'll hear from Councilmember Drum. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Councilman Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System. I thank you to Councilmember Donovan Richards for leading this hearing about parent-child separation in non-domestic violence criminal proceedings. <coughs> Excuse me. Last November, my committee held a hearing about parent-child separation in family court that looked at the process of removing children from their parents' custody. We heard about the trauma that can result from even short separation and examined how we can strengthen the process to keep children in their own homes. Less than two weeks later, the entire city saw the video of Jasmine Headley's arrest in a public benefits office where her son was literally ripped from her arms. What is much less known, which what is much less widely known, is that at her arraignment, 
where among other things she was charged with endangering the welfare of a child, an order of protection was issued that prevented Ms. Headley from even seeing her son. The charges were ultimately dismissed and the order of protection lifted after video of the arrest stirred justifiable public outcry. But how many other Jasmine Headleys are out there? How many parents find themselves needlessly forbidden from seeing their children based on an order of protection issued at a criminal court arraignment? To issue a temporary order of protection, a criminal court must find good cause to believe that there is a danger of intimidation or injury. The district attorney must make a presentation of facts and law to support their position for a temporary order of protection. In practice, district attorneys request order of protection in almost every case involving a complaining witness, regardless of how much information is actually available at the time of arraignment, whether the person being protected wants or needs court intervention, or collateral consequences for a defendant's family, housing, or job. Public defenders indicate that the court grants an order of protection in virtually every instance in which a DA requests one. A full order prohibits a defendant from having any contact with an individual from the moment that it is issued, including being the same household, school, building, or workplace. Overpoliced communities risk further destabilization as a result of the pro forma issuance of such orders that can render defendants homeless, unemployed, and without family support. Defendants have a right to due process, but courts have found that having an opportunity to be heard at their arraignment satisfies that requirement. At the request of the defense attorney, orders of protection are offered made, often made subject to family court modification. But while a family court could legally remove the order, it typically will not. The perfunctory nature of most orders of protection and the general disregard for collateral consequences led in the spring of 2017 to a new review procedure in the Bronx. Cases involving family members where either the defendant or the complaining witness is under 21 and living in the same household are now required to have an expedited hearing in the domestic violence part of criminal court, often as soon as the next business day. We are interested in learning whether this program has addressed any of the problems inherent in the current rubber stamp system for orders of protection and whether there are steps our district attorney should take or policies they should adopt to prevent the unnecessary separation of parents from their children in non-domestic violence situations like Jasmine Headley's. I look forward to hearing today from the administration, legal services providers, and advocates about how to better implement child-centered, center, trauma-informed policies in criminal cases. Um, and if I may just mention that we've been joined by Council Member Debbie Rose from Staten Island, who's a member of the Committee on the Justice System. Uh, and if I may, Council Member Paul Vallone, who is not a member of, of my committee, but he's a swell guy, <laughs> nonetheless. Always glad to have Paul Vallone. All right, we're going to go to Danny Drum, and then I believe uh, Councilmember Williams is making his way up as well. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Imagine the horror, the sheer horror of being a parent or caregiver during the chaos of an arrest when the welfare of your child is foremost on your mind. Imagine the tremendous terror of being a child witnessing your parent or caregiver being hand handcuffed and led away. Arrests are traumatic, especially for small children who may not fully understand what is transpiring. We as a city must do everything we can to minimize the trauma of arrest on child bystanders. Intro 1349 will ensure that the police department implements child sensitive arrest policies aimed at reducing trauma and supporting child bystanders, physical safety and emotional well-being following an arrest. This legislation lays out procedures that police should follow in dealing with young bystanders. For arrest unrelated to child abuse or neglect, a parent or caregiver must be given every reasonable opportunity to ensure that their child is in safe hands. The police department must be trained on dealing with such children and implement practices aimed at diverting and calming them. I look forward to hearing from the range of experts on this issue. I am also interested in hearing about the encouraging practices already being pursued by the NYPD and how those can be spread to all corners of the city. This is an issue that my office has been working with advocates on for a very long time. I'm grateful to Chair Richards and Chair um, 
uh, Lansman for holding this hearing, which is part of a larger dialogue in the wake of the arrest of Jasmine Headley. I am hopeful that the result of this conversation will be the improved treatment of New Yorkers and their families by the city employees who should be serving them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm now going to go to uh, someone uh, I wondered was it, were they going to make it. I heard there was something going on tomorrow in the city of New York, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, glad to see him here. Uh, we'll go to uh, Jamani Williams. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Richards, Chair Lansman, and my colleagues for holding this hearing, as well as those te who will testify before us today. The failures of our criminal justice system do not just punish those who are incarcerated. There is an effect that resonates throughout the neighborhood and within the home. It punishes families who lose a husband, a mother, a father. The trauma caused by the separation of families can and does have an immense impact on the long-term outcomes of children well into adulthood. It lends to a cycle of pain, incarceration, and negative interactions with law enforcement and the criminal justice system that we as leaders must work tirelessly to stem in our system. That's why I'm proud to sponsor legislation creating an inter interagency task force charged with studying the obstacles faced by children of incarcerated parents from arrest to reunification. Under this bill, the task force will consist of the commissioners of the Department of Correction, Children's Services, and the Police Department, as well as three members appointed by the mayor with relevant experience in the area of children of incarcerated parents, and three such members appointed by the Speaker of the Council, the Speaker of the City Council. These members would serve for a term of one year without compensation and would meet quarterly. The task force would invite representatives of the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, and any other relevant state agency. The task force would issue a report of its findings and recommendations to the mayor and the speaker of the city council within 12 months of the law's effective date, including arrest protocols for custodial parents, child-centered visitation, and facilities at incarceration fa facilities. Mental health supports and services for children of incarcerated parents and support services for incarcerated parents and their children upon reentry. It cannot be overstated the harm caused by being ripped away from your parent and how that harm often leads to a pattern in the lives of children and adults that impacts them beyond that moment. This is why my bill would allow our agencies to study that impact and work with in intention to mitigate it for young New Yorkers throughout the city. I've seen task force uh, that this council put together have tremendous results uh, from the task force to combat gun violence, uh, which helped uh, lead to the mayor's office of gun violence prevention, the task force to study uh, summer youth jobs, uh, which is helped champion by uh, the uh, Chair uh, Ro uh, Rose, Deputy Leader Rose. Um, so these, inter these uh, task force help people who might otherwise, otherwise be thinking in silos to concentrate on a very specific issue uh, and try to break down the barriers. Uh, this, this thing tends to have cycles uh, where people are not able to discern kind of the emotions they're feeling, and so we see a lot of things happening and recycling and generational. We want to find a way to try to block that, and I think this interagency task force might have a great assistance in doing that. Again, I'm thankful to the chairs for holding this hearing on the bills today and bringing into focus the often overlooked but damaging trauma and suffering caused by the criminal justice system on our youth and children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now joined by council members Matteo and Brenner. Myself, sorry, the M, sorry. Sorry. I didn't have coffee this morning, so. All righty, we're going to go to Assistant Chief Pachardo, Deputy Chief Teresa Tobin, and then Executive Director Oleg uh, for testimony now. Uh, so he's going to sway you in. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? I do. Good morning, Chair Richards, Chair Lanchman, and members of the Council. I'm Assistant Chief Fausto Pichardo, the Executive Officer of the Patrol Services Bureau. I'm joined here today by Deputy Chief Terry Tobin, Commanding Officer of the Office of the Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing, and Oleg Chernowski, Executive Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to testify about the oversight topic of family separation in certain criminal cases, as well as the legislation being heard today. The department's commitment to fighting crime is born of a passion, first and foremost, to protect those who are vulnerable, those who cannot help or control their circumstances. It is this very commitment that has allowed the department to leverage the, the city's historically low crime rates in furtherance of victim and vulnerable population-centered initiatives. 
Initiatives such as the Crime Victims Assistance Program, which has placed crime victim advocates into every precinct and police service area across this city. These advocates aim to mitigate trauma in the aftermath of crime, give information to victims about the criminal justice process, and support them as they go through the court system. It helped victims develop a safety plan to prevent repeat victimization, provide assistance to access needed services such as safe, affordable housing, emergency NYCHA transfers, victim compensation, medical care, or public benefits, and links victims to other local service providers for additional and more specialized assistance. Another example is our Homeless Outreach Partnership with the Department of Homeless Services, which has offices across the city connecting with those living on our streets with the goal of transitioning the street homeless population into treatment programs, safe havens, drop-in centers, and shelters, particularly during the cold winter months. Likewise, the Child Trauma Response Team, which began in 2016, is yet another example and now encompasses 10 precincts and police service areas in Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. The Child Trauma Response Team program involves follow-up home visits to residences that experienced domestic violence incidents in which children were present in order to offer traumatic stress treatment and other services to mitigate any traumatic effects an incident may have had on a vulnerable child. Additionally, and significant to the topic being heard today, the department is in the process of instituting a child-sensitive arrest policy, which began as a pilot program in one patrol borough in 2017 and is now being rolled out department-wide. While the department has always trained its officers on practices that treated innocent children with sensitivity, this initiative is aimed at expanding the scope of these long-standing practices and codifying them in department procedures. The neighborhood policing philosophy encourages collaborative problem solving, greater community engagement and outreach, building trust, as well as a shared responsibility and partnership with those we serve to drive crime down even further. In fact, enforcement activity in the form of summonses and arrests has consistently declined since the beginning of this administration, all while crime continues to decrease. However, no matter our collective efforts towards a fairer criminal justice system, one that attempts to calibrate law enforcement action to the crime or condition being complained of, we cannot escape the harsh realities of life. There are those that commit serious crimes, such as acts of violence and domestic violence, and there are situations officers respond to where they no longer have the discretion to avoid arrest. In these cases, the crimes or actions of an arrestee dictate that response. By such situations pose many challenges, one of the most significant among them is when an arrestee has physical custody of an innocent child at the time of their arrest. A long-standing part of each officer's training is to not only know how to interact with and protect a child in such scenarios, but also be cognizant of telltale signs of the presence of a child, as it may not always be readily apparent. And to that end, the department has incorporated props, such as baby carriages, toys, and other child-specific items into its scenarios-based training exercises. For example, during the course of an exercise aimed at training officers on responding to a complaint of an assault at home, a child-specific item is randomly placed in somewhere in the mock apartment. While an officer is evaluated on his or her tactical entry and movements in that apartment, interaction with the victim and alleged perpetrator and recognition and safeguarding of evidence, among other things, an officer is also expected to spot the child-specific item and make inquiries aimed at determining if a child is present and what actions will be required to further the best interests of the child. While current NYPD protocols and training include safeguards aimed at protecting innocent children when their parent or guardian is being arrested, we realize we could do more. We could do better. As Commissioner O'Neill has often said, in some areas the department is very good. In some areas, we are the best. But in all areas, we can do better. This is why, with respect to child-sensitive arrest procedures, the department has sought the input of respected stakeholders and has undertaken a significant revision of our procedures in these circumstances. A comprehensive policy revision of this scope is not easy and cannot be done with the flip of a switch. The NYPD is the largest municipal police force in the nation, comprising over 36,000 uniformed members patrolling a city of over 8.6 million. Significant changes to a policy such as this requires time for implementation on a smaller scale, analysis of such a pilot, 
revision based on lessons learned, and a significant training component. Anything short of this could potentially result in jeopardizing the very children we all aim to protect. This is why in 2017, the department began pilot program in Patrol Borough Brooklyn South, which instituted child-sensitive arrest protocols that largely mirrored the recommendations made by the International Association Chiefs of Police and the Department of Justice. Many of the recommendations were being done as a matter of practice. For example, notifying a patrol supervisor about the presence of an innocent child, effecting the arrest in a tactically safe manner outside of the child's sight and hearing where possible, allowing the parent to reassure the child that he or she would be safe, identifying and locating a designated caregiver, identifying and securing any medication needed by the child, and encouraging the child to take a familiar object and any other items that may help the child emotional well-being. But the pilot went further. We began notifying the Administrator for Children's Services of the child's location when staying with a designated caregiver at a location other than the child's residence. We also instituted a program of enhanced training for both the domestic violence prevention officers and the domestic violence prevention sergeants. This enhanced training is necessary because as part of the pilot, designated caregivers will receive follow-up visits from the precinct's domestic violence prevention officer while the parent or guardian remains incarcerated. In the rare circumstances where an appropriate caregiver cannot be identified or located, the officer will now transport the child to the pre precinct station house or a Safe Horizon Child Advocacy Center until he or she is picked up by that designated caregiver. Child advocacy centers are comfortable, child-friendly locations staffed with teams of child care experts designed to meet the child's needs by addressing their safety and tending to their physical and emotional well-being. As an additional safeguard, we've placed posters outside precinct holding cells with a picture of a child below the words, did you forget about me? This is done so that in the rare instance where a parent who was arrested was unwilling to or incapable of or for any other reason did not notify our officers of the existence of a defendant child and officers did not become aware on their own, a parent may be reminded to notify the precinct personnel of such a fact. And last August, the department decided to implement child sensitive arrest procedures citywide modeled on that Brooklyn South pilot. We are currently in the process of training officers on the proper response of these situations and updated department procedures. I will no now turn to intro 1349. As I've laid out in the testimony, the department is not only supportive of the goals of this bill, it has already piloted and undertaken department-wide implementation of a child-sensitive arrest procedure on its own initiative with stakeholder input along the way. Although our procedure largely mirrors the requirements of the proposed legislation, it is important that operational and tactical protocols be established as a matter of department policy and not dictated by law. A policy-driven approach allows for those with proven experience in policing, as well as interested stakeholders, maximum flexibility in making necessary changes that not only address the best interests of children, but also the evolution of operational realities. Likewise, although the department has already begun to train officers on child-sensitive arrest procedures, dictating specific training and legislation may not envision evolutions in this field and can have the unintended impact of delaying rollout due to the need to retrain officers pursuant to the requirements of the bill. Finally, although the department has both unilaterally and in collaboration with council made a significant amount of data available to the public, the reporting requirements in this bill raise multiple challenges, namely, Requiring the department to report on data which is not in the department's control, such as 311 and CCRB data, and data not currently captured by department's forms or systems. As always, we look forward to working with the bill sponsor to achieve the greater goal of transparency within the department's capabilities. The department remains committed not only to the safety and welfare of affected children at the time of a caregiver's arrest, but also to our demonstrated and forward-looking initiatives aimed at protecting and advocating for vulnerable populations. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this very important issue, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Assistant Chief Petrato, and I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson as well. 
Um, so let me just start off. Um, you didn't talk about Jamani's bill. Is there any on the task force bill? Is there any uh, Are there, opinion on whether you support it or not? The administration is still reviewing the bill, and we're going to be taking a position in the future. Okay, and then on intro 1349, and I know uh, Councilmember Drum will drill down a lot more on this. I just want to point out, you know, <clears throat> when you look at the situation that arised, unfortunately, at that HRA center, um, you know, it would be our hope that we wouldn't have to legislate things like this or move to legislate that, you know, uh, officers who respond to a situation like that with a baby would respond appropriately and we wouldn't be here today. Um, but unfortunately, um, between the HRA uh, peace officers and obviously the NYPD, something went wrong. So the council's obligation as lawmakers is to uh, be lawmakers. Um, so I just wanted to point that, point that out. Um, let me just go to, I have a few questions that I'm gonna turn over to uh, sponsor Drum. Um, so according to the promotional booklet I received a few months ago, the NYPD has new procedures for mitigating the trauma a child can experience while witnessing the arrest of a parent. Um, so when were these new procedures developed? Can you go through that? And then um, tell me, in your opinion, um, what will this mean for specific situations that may arise, in your opinion? And then also, when are these procedures totally going to be in effect? And you said you mentioned that you tr started training officers. So I'm interested in knowing how many uh, officers have been trained as well. So, Council Member, I think um, a lot of the procedures that are both in the bill and both that were recommended um, uh, by the uh, International Association of Police Chief, Chiefs of Police uh, and the Justice Department, uh, a lot of those protocols have been in place through the years. For example, when an arrest is necessary and the child is present, making best efforts to affect the arrest outside of the view or s hearing of the child. In the rare instances where a child would need to be placed with a temporary caregiver, uh, ensuring that both the parent reassures that child um, in the absence of that, us re, uh, an officer reassures that child, giving the parent where it's possible an opportunity to select that caregiver, giving the child the opportunity to take an item of comfort from the home, uh, inquiring about the child's uh, medical condition, if any, or if that child uh, takes any medication, and giving an opportunity to take that medication from the apartment to go with the child. Those sort of protocols have been trained and have been in place. Uh, what we have begun doing in 2017, and I'll, I'll allow Chief Tobin to go deeper and explain uh, the pilot, is we instituted a pilot in one patrol borough which expanded upon that protocol, expanded upon the recommended practices of uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, that pilot program has, is still really in effect because there is no logical need to suspend that program. And that's in the process, that pilot and what we've learned from it is in the process of being rolled out department-wide. And uh, Chief Tobin- That's in Brooklyn South, the pilot, right? The pilot was piloted in Brooklyn South and now we're in the process of instituting these protocols into the patrol guide and as well as doing training and, and actually building upon what the recommendations of the stakeholders and the International, International Association of Chiefs of Police was. And I'll, I'll allow Chief uh, Tobin to expand. And before you turn to her, uh, so out of the recommendations that DOJ and the, ch uh, the chiefs uh, came up with, um, chief of police and departments came up with, did you reject any of their recommendations or everything you, that they came up with you follow through? I, I think the chief could the expand chief okay. Good morning. So most of the provisions that were in the IACP policy were already in action in the NYPD. The three new components that were added to the policy were, one is that the CAC, which is the Child Advocacy Centers in each borough, would um, be a place that officers could take a child if there was going to be a, a period of time between the time the person was taken into custody and the 
person who is assuming caregiving would be able to pick up the child. Uh, the second was that if the person remained incarcerated, um, on the third day, the domestic violence officer in the precinct where the child was located would go and do a home visit. And lastly, we have been rolling out training for domestic violence officers and sergeants that take place right at the CAC. And um, we have done Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, we're scheduled for the Bronx um, in March. Okay, great. And um, so, okay, so those are the three new recommendations. And just go through, and I don't know if, I mean, I want to go through uh, Ms. Headley's situation. Do you think that if, so, so can you speak to um, some of the uh, specifics of that situation? So after that situation arose and she was arrested, um, what did, 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 did her child get taken to a, a child advocacy center or what, what happened after her arrest? How did NYPD follow up after that? I mean, unfortunately, we can't speak to the specific situation because it is the subject of, of current litigation. However, what I can say more broadly is that as a result of that incident, both HRA and the NYPD uh, did a close review of their protocols and um, collaboratively we've both instituted changes within our respective organizations. So for example, uh, if the NYPD is called to the scene of an HRA facility, uh, a patrol supervisor is now dispatched in all such scenarios. HRA also instituted a protocol that prior to calling the NYPD based on an incident happening at their facility, uh, they have a chain of command including supervisors uh, that would review the incident and determine whether or not the police department should, should be called to the scene. And there's a chain of command that's established between the two, uh, two agencies in the event that we're called to the scene of these incidents who takes control and, and at what time. So I think the, that review and the determinations that both agencies have come to should result in a significant decrease in the number of times the NYPD is actually called to an HRA facility and it certainly should, um, should ensure that uh, unfortunate incidents like the one that you referenced are minimized if not eliminated. So Chief Tobin, if you can, and let's, let's move away, let's not focus specifically on that incident because I know there are a lot of different situations that arise in HRA centers that may not have got uh, the amount of publicity as Ms. Headley's situation. So take me through um, a similar situation now. Let's, let's remove Ms. Headley from the situation now. Take me uh, through how the NYPD now, based on um, some of the new training and protocols being put in place. And let's imagine we had a similar situation. How would the NYPD respond um, now in a situation like that? Let's, uh, so as you know, we are in the process of doing crisis intervention training for all our officers and part of our um, training for in crisis intervention training is de-escalation uh, techniques and our goal is always to gain voluntary compliance um, where a parent would um, willingly allow the officers to have the child while they are um, removed from the scene and, and processed. Right. And, and just take me through, and I know you mentioned the, the patrol guide as well now. So the pr new procedures that you're looking at doing, they, they've been added to the patrol guide. Has anything been ad added to the patrol guide so far? And I know you mentioned in your testimony um, that um, some of the procedures were being added, but I didn't see a clear indication on whether they were being added into sure, the so patrol guide. With, with the full implementation of the Brooklyn South Pilot Department wide, there will be the, the procedures that the department has been doing as a matter of practice for decades and has been trained to do is now gonna be, is now gonna be codified into the patrol guide. So 
Um, I think it's in its final stages now. We're in the process of implementing it. The training, as the chief uh, mentioned, is well underway, if pretty close to completion. The patrol guide sections have been revised, although not finalized, but once they're finalized, they're gonna be put into the patrol guide. And obviously, as you know, the patrol guide is posted online, so the online patrol guide would be updated. And which for, section in the patrol guide is it going? I mean, on? that's, it's not finalized yet, so I'm gonna, no. I'm not really sure at this and point. And when do we uh, anticipate full completion, uh, I, anticipated timeline? I don't, I don't have an exact date. I think certainly this year. Uh, I know we're at the beginning of the year, so we're hoping for sooner rather than later. I think you're, as you've heard by Chief Tobin's testimony and Chief Pichardo's testimony, that we're pretty well underway already, and uh, so we don't envision it taking a significant amount of time longer, but we certainly think it'll happen this year. And in your, can you speak to the confidence, and I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Lansman and the drum. Um, are you confident now that with the specific training um, procedures that are being put in place and based on this pilot that we will not arrive back at a situation uh, that we all witnessed, unfortunately, with this incident that was highly publicized? We, we are confident. We think that all, the entire police department would benefit from, from the new protocols and from the training associated. And um, penalties or repercussions if an individual, if an officer does not adhere to the new policy? I think it's, as is the case with all deviations from department protocol, um, I think there would be, a, a, not I think, I know there would be an investigation. Uh, determination would be made if, obviously, if it was an intentional deviation, whether it was an accidental, and the appropriate um, discipline would be calibrated to the facts of any particular case. Is it a case that uh, is, unintentional and training, additional training is needed? Is it something that's intentional and more of a significant discipline is needed? I think those determinations are made on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, you didn't mention how many of patrol officers were trained already. How many? There are over uh, 12,000. So uh, over 12,000. When do we anticipate the entire department will be trained? I think the the goal of um, the goal of the escalation uh, CIT is to have 16,000 trained by uh, by 2021, which is um, and as the chief said, we have 12 and a half thousand done already. I mean, it's a pretty intensive uh, and extensive training. Uh, once the protocols go into effect with respect to child sensitive arrest policies, there's going to be a department wide. Uh, training done there and then there's an ongoing training component being done the more enhanced training for domestic violence officers and domestic violence sergeants so all of that is happening simultaneously we're not waiting for one to complete to be completed before we start the other in the specific curriculum you're using you've worked with uh, organizations such as safe horizon and others to sort of flesh out and take recommendations from them, or have you done that? How have you worked with the advocates? And you mentioned stakeholders in your testimony. Um, I'm interested in knowing who the stakeholders were that you worked with as well. I think, um, I, I'm, I don't wanna butcher the name, uh, I think the Osborne Institute. Osborne Institute, okay. Osborne, Osborne Association. Association. Um, mm -hmm. I, they certainly are a stakeholder that we've we've consulted with and, and partnered with in the past as well as other law enforcement and, and uh, our partners um, in the service provider industry as well. Okay, so you're saying you've worked with them in tandem? Yes, the, I mean our, our work towards uh, child sensitive arrest policies has dated back to 2014. Uh, it's dated back a, a number of years. Okay. Um, and again, as I said, a lot of the protocols that I've highlighted, you know, making arrests outside of the child's presence and comforting items and, and determining a, a caregiver uh, based on the parent's wishes, all of that has been in place and has been a practice with the department for decades. Um, we've just enhanced it. We've codified it, which is the goal of the, of the department-wide rollout is codifying it and then enhancing it with the CA, via the use of CACs, via notification to ACS um, and, and the like. 
and the, the, the follow-up visits by the domestic violence officers. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I think my, my big um, concern is, is not necessarily just the training, but making sure implementation obviously really happens. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't want, you know, we've spoken about this situation, <laughs> seems like for the last few months, but it really shined a, a glaring um, light on where the department could do better. Um, and I'm just hoping that implementation, not just we're training people, but that implementation is, is certain, certainly being adhered to. So I'm gonna turn over to Chair Lanceman uh, for questions, thank you. I think Council Member Drum has, uh there's something he's got to get to. So that's Thank you very much. You're very kind. There is an um, education um, meeting on funding for uh, the Department of Education, and as a former education chair and as the finance chair, I need to get over there as well. So I really appreciate um, Chair Lanceman giving me the opportunity to just ask a few questions. So my questions are really about um, your um, opposition, I guess, to codifying uh, some of the uh, suggestions or some of the, the, the pieces of my legislation. Um, and, and I, and I want to hit on a point I think that um, Chair um, uh, Richards mentioned as well, which is that it, um, the training might be there, but in practice it's not happening. And I think that was evident in the Jasmine Headley case, but I think that there have been other examples of it as well. So let me just go to your testimony, and, and, and it says here, although our procedure uh, largely mirrors the requirements of the proposed legislation, it's important that operational and tactical protocols be established as a matter of department policy and not dictated by law. Why? Well, I think, Council Member, the, the unique nature of policing and the dangers involved and the fluidity of, of incidents as we, as we arrive at them require operational decisions. Now, in terms of the spirit of your bill and the goal of your bill, we can tick down the nine items that you highlight in your bill and you can basically see that the department, in, as a matter of practice, is in fact doing those things. Now, to the extent that they're, that they're done is we make be best efforts, obviously, given the situation that we're faced with, but there's a guiding map towards how we approach uh, arrest situations when there's a child present. And we've been doing that for a number of years. We've shown as a matter of our own initiative that we want to improve and that we recognize the sensitivities involved in these situations. And that's why we've partnered with respected stakeholders in the field as well as law enforcement stakeholders to improve upon that. And we've actually improved upon that by adding protocols that are not even envisioned in recommendations made by stakeholders, but not even envisioned in the bill as well. This is just our constant mission to do better. And I think codifying protocols, specifically operational protocols in law, uh, marries us to a certain procedure, to, procedure in a certain time and doesn't account for the evolution over time. Certain practices May, ha may evolve, certain trainings may evolve because certain beliefs evolve and the experts would agree that, you know, what we believed a few years ago is not what we believe now and the training should be augmented to account for X, whereas we used to believe Y. So, I mean, the, the, uh, idea, the idea is, and I, I just want to be clear that we're not disagreeing with the premise of your bill. What, what your bill is laying out is basically what we're doing today. So I'm not gonna find a lot of criticism in your bill because you're, you're in agreement with what we're doing and we're in agreement with what you would like us to do. My, my only objection, I guess, if you will, is that it freezes us in time and we would like the flexibility to evolve over time. See, I'm not following that thinking actually because to me, what I've seen, and I've seen it even in cases other than Jasmine Headley, um, that although you state that um, procedures were in place before and that you have now tried to improve procedures, um, those procedures were not followed. And so when you have a case as egregious as this, then it makes legislators sit up and say, no, this has got to be put into law in order to force people to follow these procedures because it seems that there's not been that much success within the department getting people to follow these procedures. 
And that is really the gist of what I'm trying to get at with my legislation, is to ensure the safety of those children in particular when they are faced with a situation like what happened at the HRA offices. So I, I really have to take issue with the fact that the department doesn't want it codified and say that it's been proven now the reason why we need it to be codified. Um, can you give me an example of uh, when, if it was codified rather than just policy, that you'd need some flexibility? Well, I think, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. One, if we look at the bill, there, there are a couple of points, I think point one and three uh, would require some sort of an advanced notification or an advanced collaboration. One and three are which ones? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, w without marrying ourselves here, for example, if we have a, a, an arrest warrant that we're executing, uh, that's a good example, I think. I think these are very law enforcement's, the, the existence of, an of a search warrant or an arrest warrant uh, is a very law enforcement sensitive situation that has a lot of moving parts to it in terms of safety, not only to the people in an apartment, but residents around an, an apartment. We couldn't be placed in the situation where we're notifying third parties of law enforcement operations before law enforcement has a chance to do it. That, that would be the easiest example. Well, I can certainly there must be a way to notify Administration for Children's Services, um, an hour before you go to execute um, uh, a search warrant or something like that. No, um, I mean, I think you know, especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a case where you know that there's going to be, or the likelihood of a child being in the apartment um, is high. Yeah, I think the, the, the right procedures there or procedures that we've done for, for many years now is that when we know a child is going to be present without compromising a law enforcement operation uh, by involving third parties before, you know, during the planning stages of the operation is we ensure that individuals from the police department are assigned to tend to the needs of, of children if we know the children are there. And then we default to the protocols that I've outlined, which is ensuring to the best of our abilities that the child is outside of, of sight and sound of the arrest, that the child, if the child is gonna be placed with uh, a third party, a caregiver, uh, that the parent, to the extent it's possible, can weigh in and identify that caregiver, that the child could have a, a comforting item that they can take from the home, medication is identified if there is any. So all of these protocols are in place and it's done without compromising operations. I mean, that, that's... So basically you're saying what it is that I'm proposing, it's just that you're, you're opposed to codifying it and I don't really understand that. But anyway, let me, let me move on a little bit. Does the NYPD have a, um, a policy, written or otherwise, of women officers dealing with child bystanders on site? Uh, can you can you? Do you have that? a policy of women officers dealing with child bystanders? Yes. So, and what is that policy? So uh, as, as it relates specifically to a, a lost or a found child, you'll see procedurally in our patrol guide, as uh, Oleg stated, it's online, that delineates what steps uh, we would take as an agency to deal with that lost or found child. Uh, and so you can see that online as well. I don't have that policy in, in front of me today, but it's definitely in the patrol guide. And that's, that's specifically for women? You're speaking of female police officers, correct? Uh, yes, I'm, I asked, does the NYPD have policy, written or otherwise, of women officers dealing with child bystanders? So uh, uh, the, the policy and the procedure itself speaks to when we find a lost child and what steps uh, the patrol officers would take uh, and in securing aid for that child, uh, whether it's transportation or notifying administrative for children's services, including uh, who uh, would be best at that given time to sit with that child. And that could be a woman? That is correct. And is that often the case? Well, I, I think we have, as an agency, um, 
I would like to believe in my years of experience that, that male and female police officers at any given time, um, as I've witnessed, share the same common goal and, and, and human uh, perspective of aiding uh, a lost or found child. Um, so uh, again- And what about when a parent's placed under arrest? Any, any time that uh, a parent is placed under arrest, uh, again, the, the overriding goal is to ensure the safety of, of all parties uh, involved, and specifically to that end, uh, when we're, a child is involved, uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, as best as we can, if the option is there to uh, leave that child with a responsible adult or caregiver at the behest of the individual that was uh, being arrested, whether it be that parent, that, that we abide by that and that we do that so that we do not have to uh, bring that child to the precinct or child advocacy center or administrators for children's services. Do any of those officers who deal directly with the children have any type of a degree in child development or um, how to work with uh, children that are facing this situation? I can't speak of a, a specific incident. I, I mean, we're 36,000 uniform members on the street. I mean, you, you have police officers who have PhDs, you have police officers who are lawyers, uh, you have police officers who are artists, who, who it, it runs the gamut. Uh, going back to uh, the but training. We're not, we're not talking about that today. We're talking about child sensitive policies and whether or not officers are trained to deal with those children when in fact an arrest occurs. And so I find that answer to be somewhat evasive, to be honest with you. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to get at, and I'm not trying to um, attack the department or anything like that. We're trying to find a better way to be able to deal with these um, situations. I, I believe that the, uh, the police department is, is, has probably the best trained police officers in the nation. All and, right, so you don't want to answer that. Are responding officers alerted beforehand in the, of the presence of a child? Do you refer to a specific incident? Yeah. Uh, are they, uh, is there ever a case where an officer um, is, is brought to a scene and, and, and they're told adva in advance, there are children here, you need to bring a specialist or somebody along with you who can deal with the situation and a possible separation? I, th I can't think of a specific time that I've ever heard um, uh, a call uh, with the exception of perhaps uh, a notification through ACS, but your typical 911 call um, does not come bundled up with uh, someone. No, oh, but like, a, like in, in the HRA situation, uh, would those officers have told you there's a woman here with a child sitting on the floor? Um, and, and, you know, when, when they respond, are they aware that that's the case? And, and not only in Jasmine Headley's case, but in other cases where parents have children and there's an interaction with law enforcement. Well, the, the information that we receive uh, is, is as good and as reliable as the people who, and the folks that are calling 911 and giving us the information. So those HRA officers weren't that reliable? I can't speak specifically to that incident. In general terms, as you alluded to, if someone calls 911, the information that they give that dispatcher that in turn gives to the responding police officers, if the information is included, whether they're children present, elderly present, dependent adults present, or any other myriad of situations that could be evolving around that specific incident then is relayed to the, to the police officers that are responding to that 911 call. So when a police officer gets to a scene and sees children involved, then they would respond back to the precinct? Well, it depends what, what you're speaking of to the scene. I mean, I mean at, at times there's children uh, present at a scene of a vehicle collision. Uh, there are children present at the scene of... Well, I'm talking about when a parent's being arrested, because we're not talking about vehicle accidents today. We're talking about specifically when parents are going to be arrested. So at the scene of an arrest where a child is present, uh, first and foremost, uh, again, the overriding goal is to ensure uh, the safety of all the parties present and involved in that specific scenario, uh, the parent, the child, the officers, and to ensure that that child, if that parent is getting arrested, that- But are you calling the precinct to inform them that a child is involved? Well, the police officers that respond 
a present and in any arrest situation, police officers request a response of the patrol supervisor, which is a supervisor in the rank of sergeant or at times a lieutenant. And then they are responsible to deal with the, um, the children? Well, collectively at the scene, uh, we would, it would be a responsibility that's bared uh, upon everybody. So we would uh, afford, if circumstances dictate, that parent to speak to their child to let them know what is going on, to have that parent uh, let us know if there's someone in that household, uh, a relative, uh, another caregiver that they entrust with that child so that that child can remain in that household a familiar place or go with someone who is familiar with them? Uh, I, I don't know. It, it seems like you're arguing against yourself to a certain extent because the policies are too loose. And it seems to just support my legislation that it needs to be tightened up because it doesn't seem to be structured enough to um, support children uh, when they face these types of situations. So with that, I, I look forward to uh, continuing to negotiate with the department on the legislation. And, um, and I thank you for coming in. Thank you. Okay. And I know, before I turn over to Chair Lanceman, um, I know you can't go through specifics. Can you go through who responded? What was the rank of the individuals who responded um, at the uh, HRA Center that day? Uh, Council member, we respectfully, we can't go I mean, I know the answer to it, because I no, think I, the, I they, were, they were fairly new officers. So, they, so I think, you know, would, would uh, Councilmember Drum certainly is saying, uh, I think the police commissioner had acknowledged it um, uh, during the situation that, you know, these were fairly new officers and this is why he felt like they needed, I believe, more training or I don't even know if he said that. But the, the point we're making is that there's, there's a flaw somewhere um, in the policy and, and, and obviously that day um, when Ms. Headley, when the HRA peace officers called, there was a breakdown clearly um, in the protocols that you say that the department adheres to. So, um, so I think, you know, this is why uh, Council Member Drum is making that point. Clearly that day, if you're saying a lieutenant or whomever is supposed to show up, that day they didn't show up. So there was a breakdown somewhere. So. Well, I, I think the, the, without speaking to the incident, what, what I had mentioned is after the incident, the protocols of having a supervisor show up at every scene of an HRA call, that was instituted post-incident, not pre. So, okay. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me just recognize Council Members Cabrera, Deutsch, Cohen, Powers. Um, after we uh, hear from uh, Chair Lanceman, we'll go to Council Member Deutsch. Any questions? So I'm interested in um, the process that results in an order of protection where a parent is ordered to stay away from his or her child, as happened in the um, Jasmine Headley case. Among uh, the other in indignities she had to endure, one was that an order of protection was issued which prohibited her from uh, contacting her or, or having any connection or or contact with her with her son. And ultimately it's the district attorney's office that is asking for that, that order of protection and ultimately it's the district attorney's office that is um, uh, choosing which charges to, to bring. But that's heavily influenced by the police department's uh, uh, behavior and choices in uh, arresting someone and uh, at least arresting them based on XYZ charges. And the most common charge that triggers an order of protection will be endangering the welfare of a child, um, which is an A misdemeanor. And it's what uh, Ms. Headley was, was charged with. It's in part what she was arrested for, as I understand it, and what the DA ultimately, amongst other things, decided to charge her with. And as I'm sure you know, um, endangering the welfare of a child is, is very broad, so just for, for all of our information. A person is guilty of endangering the welfare of a, child when, of a child when he or she knowingly acts in a manner likely to be injurious to the physical, mental, or moral welfare of a child less than 17 years old. And that's extremely broad. So what can you tell us about what the NYPD's 
um, protocols and policies are in arresting someone for that particular offense and then in the course of processing that arrest at some point information is conveyed to the district attorney some likely young assistant district attorney sitting in a complaint room somewhere speaking with an officer saying okay I arrested Lanceman for X, Y, Z, and endangering the welfare of a, of a child. So, I mean, I, the department is guided precisely by the statute that you read. It's Penal Law 260.10, and we're guided by the language. So, as in any charge that an officer would charge somebody, an arrestee with, um, the officer needs to have probable cause that the elements of that particular crime have been met. Now, placing the, the charge, endangering the welfare of a child, on an arrest report does not necessarily translate to an automatic arraignment on that charge. I think at, that's where the checks and balances come in, where the police officer, the arresting officer, would be going to, bef uh, would be going to ECAB, would be going to speak to uh, ADA, that's going to write up the case, and the ADA would vet, in I guess for lack of a better term, vet the arrest and vet the charges being charged, and determine if in fact the facts of the case sustain the charges being charged, and if they don't believe that a particular fact pattern sustains. I, I know what the ADA right, is, doing. but yeah. but that's I mean I think that's the answer to your question. Where from our end, we're dictated by Penal Law 260.10 in endangering the welfare of a child. Uh, and we need to have the fact pattern needs to give us probable cause that that section was in fact violated. And then it would be up to the DA to determine right. whether or not they're going to bring so, that charge. So, right. So here's the concern, and we saw it, I think, in the Headley case. Um, I think most people would be hard pressed to identify how she was endangering or was intending to endanger the welfare of her, of her child. Ultimately, those charges were, were dismissed. And what we're hearing both from uh, the defense bar and, and from some folks in, in the prosecution world is that um, whenever there is a child in, in present where an offense is being allegedly committed, that in addition to whatever the person, the adult is being charged with, obstruction of justice, uh, you name it, the endangering the welfare of a child charge arrest is, is tacked on. And then that leads to ultimately a strong um, uh, uh, inclination on the part of the district attorney's office to, to bring that charge. Ultimately, it's their decision, but to bring that charge. And so um, what guidance and, and, and what um, uh, policies are, are officers operating under when they are arresting someone for and putting on the arrest sheet endangerment of the welfare of a child when the child's welfare was, was arguably not endangered, just was the child was, was present. Uh, I think, I think you're, you're answering the question. If a mere presence of a child at a location where a parent or a caregiver is being arrested does not result in and endangering the welfare of a child charge being charged or tacked on, as you said. I think, uh, and uh, again, as I've answered to your prior question, it's a case-by-case -case analysis, meaning the fact pattern of every case has to dictate that the probable cause exists that the individual knowingly, knowingly, and that's the element there, endangered the physical, moral, or, or mental welfare of the child. And that's done on a case-by-case -case basis. It's certainly, I would not agree with the characterization, and I understand that you are not making that characterization, that we tack on a charge or the police tack on a charge of endangering in every case that a child is present where a caregiver is being arrested. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere in, in the NYPD's training materials or in the patrol guide which says in sum and substance the mere presence of a child when someone is being arrested or the mere presence of a child when, when someone is um, in, uh, committing, allegedly committing some offense is, is not sufficient to also arrest them for endangering the welfare of a child? 
I can't say with certainty. I mean, I, I can certainly take a look at that and, and get back to you, but it's generally it would be, that would be training in the negative. Not to say that it doesn't exist. Uh, I'll look at it and see if maybe there's a, a note in a patrol guide procedure or somewhere in the, in the training, but I can tell you that generally in training, when you train to what are the elements of the crime, you're training to the elements of the crime. You're training officers that when you're going to charge an offense on an arrest report that you know and you have probable cause that the elements, each and every element of that particular crime are present. All right, well. But I'll, I'll double check. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'd, I'll we'd, do a Yeah, we'd like you to, to do that. I mean, my colleagues are covering very well and comprehensively all the other aspects that I, that I think relate to the, to the police department. Um, and my main focus is the order of protection issue. Um, but how officers, um, how officers describe their arrests and what they put on the arrest sheet and what they communicate to the district attorneys, um, especially in that first 24 hours when charges have got to be drawn up and, and there's a culture of, um, I don't want to say overcharge because that's a charged word, but there's a culture of let's put it all out there and then after the arraignment we all have a chance to, 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 to breathe, we can figure it out. And that, that practice is, is very injurious to, to, to defendants and to the, to the system. And so um, I would be interested and I would like to, to know um, and I'd like to see whatever training materials there are for officers when it comes to charge, arresting and charging for um, endangering the welfare of a child. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Council Member Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so firstly, I just want to mention that um, you did uh, you did speak about uh, the new protocols uh, within the police department uh, in regards to policy. Um, you're training 1,300 officers now on, um, in lieu of the incident of what happened to um, in the Mrs. Heatley case with the child. Now, is that being implemented now in the um, patrol guide? Like when you do training uh, for officers that attend the police academy, so aside from training the 38,000 plus offices, is this now going to be part of um, the police academy training? So um, I'll, I can double check on police academy training. What I can tell you is on December 19th of last year, a department-wide directive uh, went out to every command around the city and every commanding officer of every precinct and PSA and so on uh, was instructed to relay and train the officers belonging to that precinct or PSA or transit district of the protocol that was instituted uh, instituted after the incident. Uh, okay, so I just want to I just want I think it's important to add this into the police uh, police academy training, um, and that would, I guess that would add additional time for an officer to be trained if you putting in like different training protocols that we even had hearings in the past where you're training officers, all that should be implemented um, in the police academy uh, when an officer, before an officer becomes a cop. So all those um, uh, things that were implemented in previous bills as well. Um, I, I have been very vocal um, when it came to, to the Jasmine uh, Headley case. Um, like I mentioned before, having five children, two grandchildren of my own, and understanding what it is when you lose sight of a child even for a few seconds or not knowing where your child is. Um, so firstly, I just want to reiterate something that I mentioned uh, at the last hearing, um, how stressful it is for, you know, for an officer to do his or her job. Um, I just learned that an officer um, just committed suicide within the last 12 hours and that demonstrates how stressful an office is because we expect an officer to be a cop, to be an EMT and so many other things we expect from a cop. Um, I'm going to mention this again that as a council 
we need to stand up and ask for fair pay for every single officer in the city. $40,000 and expecting so much. We need accountability. In order to get the accountability, to get people who are going to go through all this additional training, right, and keeping them at $40,000 only to go home and not being able to provide for their families is totally, totally, totally unacceptable. When you give more accountability, when we expect more from an officer, we need to give them uh, the pay that they deserve. And I cannot stress this enough. Um, so this is something we need to talk about here in the council. Uh, finally, I just want to say um, my condolences um, to the officer who just committed suicide recently within the last 12 hours. And, um, you know, we, we need to do more. And I have no, I have no words. Um, so I'm just going to end right here. Thank you. Thank you, Haim. Um, okay, let me go back to, so let's just go back to the training for a second. So we spoke about um, ICAP recommendations. I think they came into play 2014. Um, so I just want to go back to the training. You said we've trained 12,000 people. So in terms of de-escalation, that's CIT training. Uh, we have 12,500 trained uh, with a goal of 16,000 by, I believe, 2021. Um, so we're in 2019. And you anticipate yeah, I mean, this to... I, I, Chief Tobin can probably go into the length and and but this isn't uh, how intensive a, is the training is the yeah, question. I, so on a how yeah. So the CIT training is offered on three tours a day. The class is limited to thirty participants. Um, there are, I believe, one day tour and two four to twelve tours. But I know, um, regardless of the platoon that it is given, it is given three times a day, which means that we are approximately training 90 members per week. And it's a four-day course. And the morning portion of the course is lecture-based and goes through um, crisis situations, um, specifically with mentally ill. And then in the afternoon, the bulk of the class is spent doing scenarios in the mock environments that the new academy has to ensure that what was taught in the morning um, is then put into practice in the afternoon. And as the officers go through the class, which is why we limit it to 30 so that everyone gets to participate in the scenario-based training, they're evaluated um, by both the officer instructor, but also we have mental health clinicians that evaluate them as well and the role playing is done by professional actors. And I appreciate that, and I know CIT has a lot to do with mental health. Um, very appreciative of the work and look forward to obviously releasing the recommendations soon that we've worked uh, uh, very closely on over the past year. Um, take me, so these scenarios include uh, child sensitive arrests, so does it go through? So I know de-escalation and mental health are a big piece of the CIT training, but does it cover this specific area that we're here to discuss today? Well, I think it's, I think it's the combination of all of the trainings, right? So there's de-escalation, which certainly uh, we talked at length about today, uh, the need for de-escalation training in certain situations that escalate. Uh, there's also the implementation. There's been the training dealing with child sensitive arrest protocols that officers have gotten for, I mean, as far back as anybody that I've talked to can remember going into this hearing and prepping for the hearing. And these are the items that I mentioned about making arrests outside of the uh, presence of the child, uh, you know, letting the arrestee to the extent it's possible, pick the caregiver, designate a caregiver, trying not to uh, trying to leave the child at home and having the caregiver arrive there where it's possible. So all of these protocols have been trained. Now they're being codified. Additional protocols are being added 
uh, which is the CAC, which is the ACS notification, which is the DV sergeant and DV officers and, and the home visits. So now the DV sergeant and DV officers are getting enhanced training relative to these situations. And then as this goes department wide, there is gonna be an additional uh, training that's gonna be instituted department wide of these new codified protocols. So it's, it's really um, kind of a reinforcement so there's gonna be some new pieces, which is the ACS notification and the CAC and, and the DV officers, you know, with their enhanced training. But there's also, it, there's gonna be a reinforcement of things that officers have known over the years, which are the things that I itemized. And that's gonna be done prior to the full rollout. So that's yet another layer. So it's, what it is, it's, it's a combination. I mean, I, I don't, we, we're talking about different training components and I know the question you're asking is, well, what about the CIT is specific to this? And what I'm, what I'm trying to explain is, it's a combination of all of these trainings, which get to, what, get to where you're going, which is there's, the, the, there's a de-escalation piece, there's a notification and CAC piece, there's a DVO piece. So all of these are done, and they're done in a way that gets it across to everybody in the department. Um. So I'm trying to be kind, um, but I, and I, I, this is a new commission. I think the department is certainly trying to move into a different direction and it would be foolish of me not to acknowledge it. Um, but for some reason in the back of my mind, I know that there's still this sordid history, right? Uh, between the department and especially communities of color. And I, I wanna believe you, but I'm finding it hard after seeing what Jasmine went through to really to, to really understand if the flowery depiction of the department when they arrive at an incident of giving parents a great opportunity to make phone calls and to find loved ones and so this flower, flowery story that I think is being painted, I find it hard to believe um, based on the sordid history that unfortunately we communities of color have, have endured for a long time. So just, just take me through, and that's why I wanted to understand the scenario a little bit more on you arrive at a scene, can you take me through exactly a police officer, patrol officer does in the event they have to ar arrest a, p a parent. So, I, I mean, I, to, to so, start and, and, Right, and what I'm trying to get at is, you know, is it a reality for officers to give the, the opportunity for you to call auntie or grandma to come pick up, you know, I'll just use my son D3, um, if you arrive at my house for something? Uh, is that a reality, or are you just taking me off, putting me in a squad car, and then calling ACS? So I'm just trying to get at, you know, um, and, and if it's not happening, you know, I would rather the acknowledgement of that, and then for us to say, you know what, we're gonna take, um, you know, we're, we're looking at taking measures to make sure, because the trauma associated with separating a child from their parent, like, you know, is real. You know, it has long-term effects. So I, on I think, children, right? Um, so seeing your parent arrested does have long-term consequences. Um, my wife's in education. I know her, a child in her school, perhaps I think I've heard of incidents where, you know, the child comes to school and paints a picture of the parent being arrested by the police. You know, like, you know, the kid's in elementary school. So I'm just trying to understand you know, are we, are we really giving due process to the parents to move, you know, um, their child into a loved one's hand without having to endure such trauma um, when a parent is being arrested? Um, so, you know, do you allow them to actually pick up the cell, a cell phone and uh, would you have allowed Ms. Headley to call grandma to come pick up her son? Let's remove her from the situation, so, but would I, I take mean, me through a scenario. 
before, and, and Chief Pichardo could will take take you through a, a, a scenario. And but let me just say that it absolutely is happening. I mean, it's it's very hard. The situation you point to is an unfortunate situation, but it's very hard to gauge every interaction where a police officer responds to an incident based on one interaction, although it was a publicized interaction. But there are, I think you would agree, in a city of 8.6 million people that there are a much larger number of interactions than one, a much larger number of interactions than we would like to see. But all of those, the vast, vast, vast majority of them end with a child being left with a designated caregiver as chosen by the parent. I mean, that's just the reality of it. I mean, that's how most of the incidents play out. Most of them play out and they're de-escalated de situations. Most of them play out with either a caregiver that's already living in the home that's not, that's not being arrested or a caregiver that the arrestee is given to the extent that they're capable so of doing it. So on the it. scene, that yeah, would be worked out. Yeah, that's what, when it can, when it can, that is the preferable. I don't like when it can. But I mean, that's when the, it, when that's, it can. But okay. that's the preferable choice. Okay. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. think there's an acknowledgement, and I think a, a lot of the advocates and stakeholders that work with us, I would hope that they would acknowledge that. Our, we've always strived not to take or not, not to have the child taken from the home, for the child to remain right in the home without having, and the caregiver, whether they already live in the home or whether they show up at the home in a relatively sh short amount of time, given the opportunity to do that. Now, these protocols that we established as a result of the pilot that are gonna go for uh, department-wide, they envision a scenario where a designated caregiver can't get there in a reasonable amount of time. And in that situation, we've worked with our stakeholder partners to find a place, that child-friendly place that has minimal trauma on the child where the child can stay awaiting for that caregiver to show up. You know, so these these are protocols that we've taken. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll Chief Pichardo can can certainly you know look back on his years and experience of experience and and tell you some stories. But we we even maybe one one that he'd like to highlight is a situation where the parent's not even there, or a parent being arrested during school hours when the child is in school and not even present, and the protocols we have in place for that. Thank you. I, I, I can certainly uh, appreciate uh, the fact that uh, the, the council uh, understands the, the line of work that we're in and that uh, no day is, is like the next day or the day prior. Uh, just as no response to a 911 call or an arrest situation is, is the same. Uh, I can tell you personally in, in, in my 20 years of experience in, in working in various parts of, of the city, Manhattan and Harlem and Upper East Side and the Bronx, um, I can't tell you of one single incident where uh, we have not gotten, and me being personally present at a scene, uh, some sort of uh, voluntary compliance uh, all through communication. And, and at times that means involving a neighbor to calm things down, uh, uh, an elderly, uh, a local respected community leader, whatever the, the situation may call for. Uh, because the overriding goal at the end of the day, uh, and it's my belief for any police officer in the NYPD, is to ensure the well-being of, uh, again, I say all parties, but when we talk about our children specifically to keep that child in, in, in a safe haven, in a safe place, and more often than not, that safe haven is in that child's home. And we will stop at, at no means involving anyone, including the person that will be arrested or is going to be arrested uh, in that process. Uh, respect to a, an incident where perhaps uh, we come upon an individual and that they get arrested and perhaps that child is not home, whether they get arrested out in the street, uh, at another location, uh, and our policy specifically we dictate and, and we ask and our officers and our desk officers that often are in the ranks of sergeants or lieutenants that a question is posed to that individual that's been arrested and that question is simply, are there any dependent adults or child that are uncared for it, either at home or anywhere, any other location. And that is, that, that is procedure in the NYPD. Uh, and if that is the case, whether that's a dependent adult 
or a child, then it's incumbent obviously upon us to ensure the well-being of that, of that child or dependent adult. And if that's a child that's in school because that individual was arrested during school hours, then we will ensure uh, by any means necessary that that child uh, gets taken care of, uh, gets that dependent adult, gets that relative uh, via the parent uh, or relative. Uh, and, and that's first and foremost our, I think, not only our procedural obligation, but I think it's a moral obligation to ensure that that child is, is okay. And uh, would a parent in that case uh, who may be uh, at the local precinct, would they, would they uh, be able to make a phone call or speak to their child? Does, does that arrange? In, in, in the event that a, a parent is arrested and a child, let's say, again, I'll go to the example of the child's in school hours, um, a, as we know, um, uh, when someone's arrested in the in confines of the city of New York, they're allotted a certain number of phone calls. And I think it's important to note that um, those phone calls regarding the well-being and the safety and looking for an individual um, or friend or family member to take care of the child does not count against the number of phone calls uh, that that arrestee has. And I think that's, that's critical to note um, because, again, we talk about the human perspective and, and whether at times that may be a police officer handing over our department phone, whether it's uh, you know, calling how, however many times possible to get someone. Because again, at the end of that school day, and we'll talk about the school incident, at the end of the school day, I, I think we can all agree that when that child is leaving that school, what better face to see than the face of a, of a relative or a known family member or friend to pick them up. And, and, and then every scenario is different, but uh, we would certainly afford um, the, the opportunity once we know the child is in a safe place, um, if that parent needs to reach out and wants to talk to the child, to, for them to talk to their child, absolutely. And then in the event that they couldn't contact a parent, what is the coordination with the ACS? Can you just go through what that looks like? Sure, so, and, and, and we'll stick with that scenario with the child's at school, um, and we, we would make sure, and, and we have school safety officers that, that are very familiar um, with the school administration officials. Uh, we will ensure that that information is corroborated to uh, the Department of Education officials that, that can help us, again, in partnership, uh, re relay a message. And if that means that at that very moment we haven't been able to uh, reach out to the parent uh, excuse me, to, an, to a relative or a family member, um, we, we want to be cognizant of the fact that if the person is arrested for a, a crime that they can get a desk appearance ticket for and are eligible, then that would also be when we talk about uh, a child in school that needs to be taken care of or cared for, that that would be another option that we would, that we would visit, certainly, so that the parent can, can go pick up that child at school. Uh, and is it feasible that the parent could make a call before they're taken into custody? So before you slap the handcuffs on, is it, uh, are there any scenarios where that happened or does that, or are you not able to uh, make that happen? Certainly, I mean, again, the, the, the situations and, and the scenarios can play out a, di a thousand different ways as we all know because no situation is the same. But to afford someone, the individual, and depending, um, you know, uh, how receptive they are to understanding the process of what is going on in that instance, and, and that being that they're going to be arrested, uh, that's certainly something that can be afforded to them. Um, and, and again, every situation is different. And nonetheless, uh, without a doubt, once they're at that at precinct station house or police service area or transit district, um, those phone calls w will be made and will be afforded to them to ensure that that child is, uh, is uh, in a safe place. I'm going to begin to wrap up. I just had a question about the child advocacy centers, and I got the, the, had the honor, I think, of visiting um, the one in Queens uh, earlier last year sometime. Um, so how often do you use the, the CACs? Um, it's very rare, um, but I think um, one of the things to note is that the number of times that we, we the police department, have custody of children is less than 1% of okay. all our um, aideds. Um, I know that it's been used a handful of times um, when we know that there's going to be um, a length of time where a caregiver is not able to respond immediately. 
Right, and then you're looking to expand, so just go through the placement so you have one in every borough? Or yes, there's a child advocacy center in every borough. And, and the DV officers and the DV sergeants are being trained at the CAC, and part of their training is to get a walkthrough of the center um, and to have input from the um, people that run the CACs in terms of what's available and, and the process of um, how the children are treated and what their day looks like when they're there. And are you looking at expansions? And I know geography could be a challenge. I think the one I visited, for instance, if I live in Far Rockaway and, right. you know, to get to that center could Queens take Boulevard. me three hours <laughs> or four right. hours. Um, so is there any thought being put into um, expanding centers or making them um, much more geographically accessible, especially to communities? I won't speak to where the center is. I don't know if it's sensitive information to discuss it here, but I know if I live even in Jamaica, Queens, it's just hard to get to this specific center. So how, since I'm assuming a large majority of these cases, like many of them are, are, are centered in certain communities, I could just say communities of color, how do we make them the centers more accessible for um, these communities? They, they are totally um, run by nonprofits, uh, right. and we. And you don't fund any of but this. No. Okay. No. Right. But I'm sure City Hall does. So, um, so we should work to make sure that you know these centers are really accessible to to families. Um, righty, I'm going to go uh, to Deutsch. I think that that's just my point on that, um, and we'll go to to Deutsch for uh, one more question, and then. Thank you. A real quick question. So, if if a um, if a parent gets pulled over for let's say a uh, suspended license at three o'clock, uh, two o'clock in the morning, or even like earlier, and she says she has children at home, what's the protocol? Well, it's r regardless of what the time frame in the morning uh, or day that is. If a, if a parent tells us at any given time that they have a uncared for a child at home, uh, we want to make sure that we give them every single opportunity in conjunction with, with the NYPD to, to find a suitable uh, guardian for them at that time. Uh, and that may entail that we may have to go to that home and find out if, uh, if they are home alone and, and then we, we would have to sort out uh, who we can, if, if available, uh, leave those children with at, at the behest of, of the guardian or, or of the parent. So if you have to play out a scenario, so this uh, mother's driving, gets pulled over, the check, the, the officer checks her license, she has a suspension. So they notify a sergeant, right? The sergeant comes down to the, to the scene and she goes, I have children at home. So how would that play out? Like what would happen? So uh, more often than not, we'd say, is there anyone that uh, at any adult or responsible party with them? And if that answer happens to be no, do you have a responsible adult or uh, individual or family member that will care for them? Uh, and if that answer is yes, then uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that, that, that those children are, are cared for um, by, that part, by, that, by that third party, if you will. So this would happen before she's taken down to the station? Well, that, that conversation perhaps initially, and again, not, I, I don't want to just go down a path where every incident is going to be exactly the same, but uh, in, a, in a perfect world, yes, uh, we'll have that conversation right then and there. Do you have somebody? And, and let's, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about it in, in a, 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 a lengthy amount of time, but that actually could take a, a few seconds uh, out. Yes, I have somebody, my, my, my grandmother lives in the adjoining apartment, they're, they're, whomever it is, my sister lives in the adjoining apartment, and yes, I'm going to call her right now, can you call her, and, and my kids are good, okay, then, then I'm good, because again, the, uh, it's, it's a two-pronged approach, right? We want to ensure that we have a, uh, voluntary compliance, so as always, from the person that's going to be arrested, and, and we understand that not only is the thought of the child being left out, uh, alone probably a little uh, traumatic for, for the parent it, them, themselves, but also the fact that they're going to be arrested, right? So we have to be cognizant of that. So it's a two-pronged approach, uh, and I, I think we can all agree that if someone who's being arrested in, in that particular scenario has the comfort level that their kids are okay at home, then the, the arrest process and the arrest itself will probably go uh, a lot smoother. 
So would that be the officer's question, or would that, would that be the sergeant's question to the, uh, to the motorist? Well, at the like scene, what is the protocol? At, at the scene, it, it could be uh, any, anyone's question. At the station house, uh, we have uh, department documentation that uh, the officers ask, as well as the desk officer, being that sergeant or lieutenant, whoever may be in the desk, ask the questions as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, so I want to thank you for coming out today, and and um, you know obviously we're here because obviously a situation occurred. Um, but you know for that situation, that one situation, we know that there were hundreds or more thousands that we may perhaps not not know about. Um, just want to make a few points as we close out. So obviously ICAP recommendations came out in 2014. And I know Oleg acknowledged that um, the department has been doing this for, for a long time. So I'm hoping that the patrol guide, that it's not gonna take another year since you know the department has really been doing this already um, for this stuff to be added to the patrol guide. Um, I do wanna acknowledge, I'm, I'm grateful to the police commissioner for um, really working with HRA and, and, and I think taking a lead in saying that PD should not have to respond to a lot of these situations. Obviously, I don't think the police department needed to respond the day of Jasmine Headley's situation. Um, but it, you know, it all boils back down to that, that same statement we make all the time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, poverty is criminalized in our city too often, and we, we have a long way to go um, to fix that. But I do want to acknowledge at least the police commissioner, and I agree with him, has been saying this. A lot of these situations should not be NYPD situations. They shouldn't arise to the NYPD having to take the lead on these situations. A lot of it is really systematic um, and, you know, and I'm hoping that we as a council continue to, to push and make a dent in, in, in agencies like HRA and others um, as well. Um, so I want to thank you for coming today. We look forward to continuing this conversation um, and, and I'm going to obviously go to Chair Lanceman to close out as well. Um, but I'm hoping we never have to find ourselves here again. <laughs> that is the, the you know, <laughs> um, and that we never have another um, Jasmine Headley situation again. I think she's an unsung hero um, for a lot of individuals whose voices has sort of been clouded out um, going through this system for a long time. Um, so I'm hoping out of that, um, we continue to make progress in this city, um, especially for those who unfortunately are down on hard times. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna go to Chair Lanceman and then we're gonna get to the next panel. Yeah, just to close, wanna emphasize, um, very concerned that the endangering the welfare of a child uh, charge is, is used very liberally and, and, and almost ex excessively. So I'm, I'm very interested in getting the, the training material that um, you use to, to train officers so that they can make an informed and correct legal judgment as to when they should be um, uh, recommending those, those charges. Um, and then we might have some, some more follow-up and, and we might be asking for some, some data because um, that is the charge and, and that is the, the beginning of a process that almost always ends up with an order of protection against the parent vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis her, own, her own child. And we have to be very, very careful in how those charges are are brought, how those arrests are made and those charges are brought. But I look forward to getting that information from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right. Next up, our friends uh, from the Public Defenders, uh, Lisa Schreibersdorf from Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, I think it's a Fallon s speaker from Bronx Defenders, Kate Wood from the Legal Aid Society. I also want to acknowledge we were joined by Councilmember Menchaca.
Ready? Good morning. Um, let's, yeah, let's, let's get sworn in and we'll get started. Do you swear or affirm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, let's hear what you got to say. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lisa Schreibersdorf. I'm the executive director of Brooklyn Defender Services. I also um, represented Jasmine Headley. So I want to start um, by thanking the council for the support of Jasmine Headley throughout the process of um, changes that I think are much needed. And I just want to say that she really appreciates the look at all these different issues. As you well know, she did come to, to a hearing recently and I think said what she needed to say. Interestingly, eight million views around the country of her testimony. We actually took it in, you know, just took some highlights which I think shows that this isn't just a local issue, but it's a national issue, that all of these issues are national. And there are a lot of issues, um, I think, that spring out of that. This is definitely one of them, and, you know, um, I, but I, I no longer feel like it's appropriate for her to speak directly to these things, um, having said her piece, but I want you to know that she d is aware of it, and she does, you know, ask me to speak, you know, on behalf of her, and I think others in her similar circumstances. Um, all right. So Brooklyn Defender Services represents people that get arrested and we also represent parents who have had their children removed in child welfare proceedings. Um, we also represent immigrants who have their children removed, sometimes at the border, unfortunately, we've had those cases, but also when parents are taken to be detained for deportation proceedings. So the issue of parents being taken by the government, I'm just using sort of broad strokes here. It's really pervasive. And um, as I think, you know, Council Member Richards has pointed out many times, of course it is more prevalent in communities of color. That is clear, and especially poor communities. Um, in many ways, we, you know, in this city and I think elsewhere in the country, have criminalized poverty. We have also used poverty um, as, a, as a basis for destroying families. And I think if you ask, my child welfare, you know, practice attorneys and staff, um, that's, you know, that's what they feel. They feel that ACS, I mean, and, and I'll just say society at large, because I don't think any of these agencies operate in a vacuum, really does um, target poor communities of color, particularly black communities, but also Latinx communities. And um, that's the same communities that are targeted for arrest. So the number of black children that are removed from families is, you know, I'm sure you have numbers, but it, the percentage is, you know, astronomically higher than it is for white children. And so when you add in the element of arrest being more prevalent in black communities and Latinx communities, um, I think you're multiplying a problem that is really profound. And the intersection of these issues, I think, should not be taken lightly. Um, the one, my first thing I really want to say is that I really appreciate the council looking at the issue of what to do with children when the parent gets arrested. There are lots of times parents are unavailable for their children. You could have a medical emergency and they call an ambulance and the police are there and they have to figure out what to do. Same problem, the kid's getting out at three o'clock. Parents really care about what's happening to their kids even when they are in crisis. As you well know if you're parents or certainly as children because you know how your parents felt. Um, the system treats parents as if they don't care about their children. They treat parents who get arrested as if they don't care about their children. And the first thing I really want to say is that is just not true. When w I meet a client in a criminal case, especially a mother, if they were arrested, the first thing they're asking me about is not well, what's going to happen to me, but where am I, do you know if the police you know, found somebody to watch my kids? Where are my kids? What's going to happen to my kids? And you have to understand that when the arrest initially happens, the, um, nobody really knows how long that parent's gonna be absent, just like when you go to the hospital. Do you know if you're gonna just be released from the, by the emergency room in a few hours, or are you gonna be admitted, or maybe pass away? And that is often what happens with arrest. When we first meet the client, we have no idea how long they're gonna actually be at Rikers Island or what the other impediments are to release. The police probably have some idea of how serious the matter is. We heard mention of driving with a suspended license. We know that person likely will not stay in jail very long, but another person could be arrested for selling drugs, and that person might be staying in jail for a while. 
or it could be even more serious. So I think it's really important to know that even parents that get arrested for major and important and serious crimes, people that are accused sometimes are innocent, people are still can love their parents even if they, you know, if they, if, people love their children even if they might have committed a crime. And I think part of the problem with this conversation is that it has this fundamental underlying assumption that parents that get arrested don't care about their kids and don't have, don't, don't aren't good parents. And that is also the underlying premise, I think, in the child welfare system, where parents who don't have enough money to have a really decent home for their kids, that they somehow they don't care, and that they're not gonna care when somebody comes and tries to take their kid away. And I think that's the space that's very difficult to navigate, and that's the exact space that we got into in the Jasmine Headley case, that at some point, someone should just give their kid up because you know, the police are asking for their kid, and that just isn't what happens. I'm just gonna give you one example. So many, many, many years ago, I'm probably the oldest person in the room practicing the longest. You know, there were no police procedures, and probably like maybe 20 years ago, there was a, an incident, I think, where the police left a kid, a child, you know, alone, and something happened, I don't remember the details. I'm trying to rack my brains. But it was after that that the police actually started asking people, do you have a child at home? Is there a child? that you need to, that you're taking care of. And actually, I will say, you know, just to give credit to the police, they actually do a very good job of that. And while that, yes, I understand that the gray area and the confusion, I agree with all of that as well. But I wanna point out that Jasmine Headley's son was brought to her mother. I can't remember, I don't know that I ever asked her specifically what, how that happened, but ACS did get called, but that, later on they did a minimal investigation. They did provide that child with the home that he was familiar with. And I do believe that the police do do that most of the time. And every situation is very different. Sometimes there are really hot situations going on where somebody's getting arrested in the home, people are screaming, there's a lot happening. I just think the expectation that somehow we can moderate that experience so that the child is really isolated from it, it's maybe unrealistic. We have to work within a situation that we have. Okay, so having said that, here are my recommendations. First of all, let's stop arresting so many people, okay? The first thing is, if somebody is driving with a suspended license, is it really worth all of this? What we do by taking, you know, possibly facing a child having been, having to be brought to a child advocacy center or something like that. So the first thing we need to do is reduce, reduce, reduce arrests, okay? The second thing we need to do is we need to, have, you know, I, personally, I am a believer that having a civilian person with the police to make these choices and make these decisions is better than having ACS there, right? I appreciate the look at this, but I'm worried about some of these bills enhancing and increasing the role of ACS in the lives of poor people of color who are already over-targeted. I am really profoundly concerned about that. If ACS is involved in every arrest where there's a child, you're gonna double your child removals because once they get involved, there's more chance that they will you know, find something and they are in many ways you know, there's an incentive for them to find a reason to remove a child. And I will say, even in Jasmine Headley's case, where it was, I think everybody understood that she really was not a threat to her child, we still had to do the investigation in that case. So ACS doesn't let go. They really hold on tight, they follow through, they are kind of relentless. So I just wanna say I have real concerns about the, some of these proposals, and I think there are some better solutions that usually involve civilians. If a civilian nonprofit, you know, whatever nonprofit agency whose job is to really be, just stay with the child until the caregiver can come, um, most people have somebody that they can call, right? I think the problem for us, we find, is a little bit later on when, the, when maybe the neighbor comes, right? Which is, I just think, look about your own life. If something happened, and I, I go back to thinking about going to the hospital. If I had to call an ambulance when my child was young, I would have asked my neighbor, can you please just come and stay with my son? while my sister's on her way. That's what no, most people would do, and that is what our clients do. But just FYI, after they get to jail, there's a big sign on the wall that says, did you forget about your child? And there's a picture of a kid. As if that's all anybody's worried about, like that the, 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 the after they just remove that person from the child, they're worried that the parent forgot about the child. And then they put, them, they put the sign in, this, in the cell where there's no access to a phone or anything like that. So I just want to say, I think the whole premise of the way that we're treating these parents is if they don't care about their children, as if it's their fault that somehow their child is alone, um, that is one of the issues I think needs to be looked at very carefully. Um, having said that, I just want to 
just address that what is a protection issue a little bit, um, and then pass to my colleagues. Um, so, I, by the way, there's a little more in our testimony, of course, about also once ACS gets involved, there's a good chance somebody will end up on this, the registry, and then that will affect forever their chance of getting a job. So it could be the most minor case. They can end up on the registry uh, after an investigation that's, you know, very minimal burden of proof, and it just spirals the family downward. So I just do want to minimize the number of situations where ACS is involved. And I just want to add one more thing on that issue. We recently had a, a child who was removed by ACS. It didn't involve an arrest. And the, for whatever, I, I forget the details of the case, but it wasn't an arrest. And they couldn't find somebody right away or they didn't believe that they should provide the, those particular people that were available with the children. They took a child who was sitting in a wheelchair with a broken leg to, I think, a child advocacy center or another kind of holding center that they have. And that child sat there for a week. The child was supposed to have their, yeah, the child was supposed to have their cast removed. They didn't go to school. There was no way to get the child in the wheelchair around. And I just want, there, th what happens to children when they are removed by ACS is not some kind of better outcome, right? Th that is not some kind of magical panacea that we should be looking to. So I just want to make that point really clear. The issue of orders of protection is a very important one, which I really appreciate you bringing up. Many people are bored by legal issues, and I appreciate that Council Member Lansman is not. Um, but of course, these legal questions have very profound impact on people. Um, the, the decision to charge endangering the welfare of a child is, I think, a very important question. Obviously, the decision of the DA to continue to prosecute that charge is another issue. In this case, in Jasmine Headley's case, police charged it. Let's assume that they believed that when she refused to give over her child, that she put the child in danger by forcing them to actually remove the child. It seems like a twisted logic, but it wouldn't be shocking if that's the way that they decided that they felt they met their burden to charge that. That is something I've heard before. Um, but then the prosecutor takes a look at it. Now again, giving them credit, young person, middle of the night, they don't always have the time to analyze it. And giving credit to Eric Gonzalez, my district attorney, he did dismiss the charges within a couple of days when it all came to light. Now, if it was not a high publicity matter, I'm not sure that it would have been, but um, they, they did ask for a full order of protection, which was issued in court. So that meant that if Jasmine Headley did not have a complication, I don't know if you remember, she had a New Jersey situation that was taken care of immediately, but um, because of that, she was held. Um, if she had been released, she wouldn't be able to see her child. And um, the issue of orders of protection is very complicated and it's just overly broad, but the reality is we need actual state legislation that changes the burden of proof for how to get an order of protection and requires the court to have a real hearing like they would in family court, which you might hear from the Legal Aid Society. You can't hold a child in family court without giving them a hearing if they ask for it within, you know, within three days. And in, in criminal court, you're in front of a judge for literally 10 seconds where the DA says, we're asking for a full order of protection, and the judge says, okay, and that's the end of it. And there's no burden, there's very little discussion. It is you're very disturbing, and it goes way beyond these kind of cases into a whole range of cases, including many cases where domestic violence is charged, and maybe the child is there and there's an endangering, but maybe the child is not even there and there is no endangering ch charge. And what happens is they issue an order of protection sometimes subject to family court, and that re there is no family court proceeding. Right? If there's already a family court proceeding, that's fine, because we can go to family court and talk to the judge there. But let's say there is no family court proceeding. You're now requiring a person who's just been arrested, and just for fun, I like to say, let's say it's a mom, because I think it helps us understand it better. A mom who gets arrested, because that happens about 20% of the time, and um, it's a domestic violence incident, and there's a full order subject to family court. Now that mom has to go to family court and file her own case in family court in order to have the right to see her own children. And now, again, she's triggering an ACS investigation. So we advise people all the time, we, we recommend against going to family court unless you're already there because we don't see family court really as a family-friendly place for many people and we certainly don't see ACS whose main responsibility is to investigate and determine whether children need to be removed. I mean, that is their main role in these circumstances. So I think having said that, 
I have, um, those are my main concerns. Of course, I think you should hear from my, um, oh, I'm sorry, I just had one thing that I jotted down while the police were testifying. You know, there is a national movement around de-escalation for police officers. Um, I don't believe New York City is the front of that movement at all. And I, I do think that if those officers had real de-escalation, not just training, but a real understanding that every situation, let's say 99% of situations could be managed without arresting somebody, without it getting out of control. In Jasmine Edley's case, it was already pretty much out of, not in, it was in control as she was walking out. And then the worker in the, in the facility started it up again, and that's how she ended up on the floor. If the police officers see at that time it got hot again and it got heated, and I don't want to underestimate what do we expect these police officers to do? They're not superhuman. But I think even at that moment, if they would have said, okay, everybody, relax, calm down, let's stop, let's let her get up, if that had happened, I don't think not only are they not trained to keep de-escalating, don't give up de-escalating, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, but also that there's a real culture of de-escalation in the police department, and there really is not, right? The police department, the reason that they took the, that child so dramatically was because she wasn't listening. You know, uh, we're telling you, do the, you know, and I think that that's a culture shift that maybe we could start talking about a little more. Um, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. You may go again. Good morning. Uh, my name's Kate Wood, and I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society. Um, as I'm sure you know, the Legal Aid Society is the nation's oldest and largest not-for-profit legal services organization representing low-income individuals and families across a variety of civil, criminal, and juvenile rights matters um, while also fighting for legal reform. I'd like to thank both chairs, Lanceman and Richards, for holding this very, very important and timely hearing. We know from statistics that at least 35,000 children lived with a parent who was arrested in 2017. All of those children experienced the trauma of family separation as a result of their caregiver's arrest, um, and likely a significant number witnessed the arrest itself. Witnessing the arrest of a caregiver is stressful, traumatic, and can have long-lasting harmful consequences for these children, and given the firmly established racial and ethnic disparities in policing and arrest practices in New York City, black and Latinx children are no doubt disproportionately impacted by caregiver arrests. Because the manner in which children are treated at the time of caregiver's arrest can be so significant, we urge NYPD and all agencies with arrest authority to implement policies and procedures that protect the children at the time of caregiver arrest and minimize this trauma. First. Um, as evidenced by the arrest of Jasmine Headley at the HRA building, um, we believe that all entities, um, HRA, NYPD, and all entities with authority to make arrests must implement child-sensitive arrest policies. The arrest of Ms. Headley was particularly appalling um, in our view because not only was it very traumatic, no doubt, for herself and for her child, but it was also apparent that there was no justification for making any arrest at that moment. We believe that City Council must work to prohibit NYPD and other actors from making arrests, taking a person into custody, rather than issuing a summons or a desk appearance ticket when the conduct at issue does not rise to the level of a misdemeanor offense. At a minimum, taking a person into custody for non-criminal conduct should not be permitted when the person has his or her child in their physical custody at the time of the alleged incident. With regard to Bill 1349, um, we are very pleased to, to see that there's a bill requiring NYPD to, to codify so child-sensitive arrest policies and training, but we believe the bill could be strengthened in several ways. First, um, as my colleague just touched on, we recommend that a community-based organization rather than ACS assist with the arrests when a child bystander is present. There's a stigma associated with ACS involvement, um, and many families may be hesitant to trust ACS workers or feel comforted by their presence. And any feelings of distrust or fear would undermine the very purpose of their presence in these highly traumatic moments. 
Second, and it sounds like NYPD has already started to do this, um, but we would recommend that there is a, a place for um, the department to bring children that's safe and child friendly if the child cannot wait um, at home um, until an alternative caregiver is located. And finally, several provisions of the bill have a, the language where practicable um, included. And we believe this undermines the urgency and necessity of these requirements. And without a clear definition of what where practicable means, it allows for unfettered discretion by department officers. All of the requirements in the bill should be mandatory unless there's extraordinary circumstances, um, such as a real immediate physical threat to officer safety or others. There is a national movement towards de-escalation and towards these child-sensitive arrest practices, and we believe it's time for New York to get in line with that movement. Um, we believe it's also time to ensure that the citizens of New York City are not subjected to unnecessary humiliation and potential trauma of being taken into custody for conduct that doesn't even constitute a crime under New York's laws. Thank you again <coughs> for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Richards and Lansman, and members of the Public Safety and Justice System Committees. My name is Fallon Speaker, and I'm attorney in the Family Defense Practice at the Bronx Defenders. I represent parents whose children have been removed from their care. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Every day, I meet parents who were arrested in front of their children and see firsthand how an arrest can lead to temporary and at times permanent family separation. I want to begin by telling you the story of one of our clients, Ms. B. Though similar to Jasmine Haley's arrest, Ms. B's arrest was not caught on camera or met with public outrage. Many of our clients' arrests are like this. However, her story is one that we continue to hear on a daily basis. In January of this year, police arrived at Ms. B's apartment following a call alleging a domestic dispute. The officer spoke with Ms. B's husband, who described an argument between him and Ms. B. He indicated that he did not want to press charges against his wife. However, the police were intent on arresting Ms. B after they arrived to her apartment. The police forced their way into a bedroom where they found Ms. B with her son. She was holding her son, crying. Her son was crying. They were terrified. Police officers began to yell at her. They threatened her to arrest her if she did not hand over her child. They were aggressive with her and they pulled her son from her arms. These officers refused to allow Miss B to comfort her son during that moment prior to her arrest. Instead, they arrested her with her son present and they charged her for endangering the welfare of a child, resisting arrest, assault, and harassment. Ms. B's husband appeared in her criminal court arraignment. He told a district attorney at that arraignment that he did not want to go forward with the case. He indicated that he did not want nor need an order of protection on behalf of himself against Ms. B. And he also indicated that he did not believe an order of protection was necessary for his son. He indicated that Ms. B was a great caretaker of his son and that he did not feel that she posed any risk or threat of harm to her son. In fact, Mr. B asked that his wife be allowed to return home to care for his son on that day. Over the objection of Mr. B and Mrs. B's counsel, the district attorney asked for, and the criminal judge in that case assigned a temporary full stay away order of protection against Ms. B on behalf of both her husband as well as her baby. The result of that order of protection was that Ms. B's family was separated indefinitely, meaning that she could not go back home to her husband and her baby until the criminal court terminated that order of protection or that order of protection was modified in family court. And Ms. B is still bound by that order today. In addition, I would just add that ACS was called during that incident and ACS was involved with Ms. B and filed a petition against her in family court as well. 
These are not isolated cases. In our written testimony, we address specific issues with orders of protections like the one issued in Ms. B's case. We call on the city council to work with the Office of Court Administration, the Office of the District Attorney, and the courts to change current practices which routinely lead to unnecessary family separation. In this instance, because Ms. B had an order of protection placed against her, a full sale order of protection placed against her in criminal court, it made it more likely that ACS would be involved and more likely that a family court would feel unsure about allowing her to go back home with her children and her husband. We join our colleagues in recommending that all arresting officers in New York City be trained in protocols and practices to safeguard children at the time of the parent's arrest, as outlined in a letter to Mary de Blasio, included within our written testimony as Appendix A. Had the officers in Ms. B's case been equipped with the sensitivity and skills necessary to ensure the safety of Ms. B's son during her arrest, the scene could have played out very differently and needless family separation could have been avoided. Had the officers used de-escalation tactics instead of using threats um, and escalating the situation with yelling and arresting Ms. B, um, and re aggressively removing her son from her, and instead have talked to her and reassured her that her son would be safe, uh, then perhaps the ultimate separation of Ms. B with her son could have been avoided. Once a parent is incarcerated, we must expand the ability of these parents to meaningfully participate in their children's lives. While the proposed legislation is a good start, it should be expanded to include implementing more protective measures for parents and children, including funding for resources to expand video and phone contact between parents and children, increase access to therapeutic and reunification services for incarcerated parents, and a review and expansion of diversion programs to increase opportunities for parents and children to reside together while a parent pursues treatment. We've discussed all of that in depth in our written testimony. Finally, we agree that the creation of an interagency task force to address the obstacles faced by children of incarcerated parents is also a good first step. We implore the council, however, to not only consider children of incarcerated parents, but incarcerated parents and the families as a whole. We believe that the current parties listed to serve on this task force lacks representation of necessary stakeholders. While we do believe it is important to have the New York Police Department and ACS at this table, it is also essential to expand the table to include a more diverse set of experiences. First and foremost, it is critical that the task force center the voices of parents and children with lived experience of family separation due to arrest and incarceration. It is also important to include public defense institutions who represent parents who are arrested, institutions who represent children, community justice advocates, parent support coalitions, and coalitions who fight for the rights of the current and formerly incarcerated. For these reasons, we do not believe that the appropriate agency to chair this task force is the Department of Corrections. Instead, we believe that an agency in the community and informed by the experience of children and families affected by parental incarceration would be better suited at centering the voices of parents and children who have experienced family separation due to arrest or incarceration. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for your testimony. And how common is this uh, specific scenario in your day's work? It happens daily. Um, with regards, I'm assuming that you're asking how common is it that parents are arrested and the ACS is contacted. Yep. Um, in our experience, we find that parents for whatever the event is, whenever a child, is, a parent is arrested and a child is present, three things typically happen. Um, that child is removed from the parent, uh, ACS is contacted, and an order of protection is issued in family court along with endangering the, ch the welfare of the child charge. Um, and that order of protection is, a, is actually, it starts in criminal court, and because ACS is involved, it is also then brought over to family, family court, court as well. Well, I, can I just add, can I just add something to that? that I just want to be really clear. Like the, that's the cases that do end up in family court have that similar story, but there are cases that never get to family court that may not be seen by an attorney that works in family court. And I just I don't want to I don't want to cut back on the idea that some kids are just returned to their the other person. That does happen, but those cases may not be seen by that attorney in family court. So yes, there's probably one a day, but there are hundreds more people arrested. And I don't, not that I'm trying to, you understand what I'm saying? 
So from that perspective, yes, every time you see that, and we see that in Brooklyn at least every day, and they see it in the Bronx every day, see it in Manhattan every single day, I'm sure in every borough. So every single day that is something that happens, without question. Yeah, so let's talk about the order of protection um, issue and, and how often is a court persuaded to do a limited order of protection as opposed to a, a full order of, of protection? Anyway. I, w I would find that not often at all. Um, most of the cases that come through um, misdemeanor or, or felony cases, when the DA asks for an order of protection, they always ask for a full stay away order of protection. Um, we are very, we are not very successful at arguing for a limited order of protection, even when we have family members who are present to support it, provide supporting evidence um, that would suggest that a limited order of protection is okay. Um, limited order of protections can be crafted in a way to ensure the, the safety of the child while allowing the parent to remain in the home with the child. However, that oftentimes doesn't happen in criminal court. And those criminal court appearances typically last under five minutes. They don't have any real information. They don't take any um, testimony or receive any evidence to consider the best interest of the child. And if, if for example, that case doesn't come over to family court, then oftentimes that order cannot be modified. And, you know, I believe that I would say that there are a lot of criminal court judges who are now issuing order of protections full stay away. There are made subject to family court modification on a temporary basis, but oftentimes that is not the case as well. That what, what's not the case? That those order protections are made subject to family court modification, meaning that if it is not made subject to family court modification and there's no pending family court case, then that person will have to um, not be able to see their child until the next court, criminal court appearance right. when that order is looked at again. Right, Cause, and, and, and is it the norm that um, the full order of protection is, is given subject to family court modification? Is that the norm? That is not the norm. We do ask for that, uh -huh. um, and we have to advocate for that. So that is not the, I would not say that that is the norm. Why, why do you ask for that? Because uh, then you have to go to family court and start a new proceeding. Is that, is that easier and quicker than waiting for the next criminal court appearance? Well, because ultimately, if our client is the sole caretaker of that child, and even if they are not the sole caretaker of that child, if the full stay away order of protection is in place, it prevents them from having any contact with the child. It effectively terminates their right to be able to parent that child until the next court proceeding. Um, essentially, they are not allowed to come into the home. They are not allowed to I understand that. What's the advantage, though, of asking for the, if, the it, if there's going to be a full order of protection, what's the advantage of asking that it be subject to modification by the family court? Well, because then, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. I was just going to say, we're not choosing between asking for a limited order, which is better, mm -hmm. and a full order subject to family court. We are never given the limited order. Right. You've so read we it, asked you've, for this subject you've, you've to family. You've lost that battle. There's right. going to be a full gonna order. We're never going to get that. So now the judge is issuing a full order. Right. At least if there is a family court proceeding, as in the case that was just described, uh -huh. and it's subject to family court, that means that when you get to family court, like the next day, that the family court judge then can go ahead and order that the person, some people think, go home, and others just say at least visit. Mm -hmm. well, so we, we do whatever we can to, to maximize the chances that family court can exercise jurisdiction. I would also add that even in cases where ACS is not involved, if there is an order subject to family court modification, we can advise our clients to go and file a visitation petition, and that would allow for them to have access to their child uh, before the next criminal court proceeding date. Mm -hmm. and, and both of your office, all of your offices, persons arrested, they're assigned the defense lawyer, from one of your offices, if it is, if there's a, an order of protection and it's subject to family court modification, are you, do you also represent that parent in going to family court or, uh, or the, they've got to find someone else or, so, what yeah. if it's, what if, what if they end up being an eight, what if they end up getting an, an 18B lawyer assigned because there's a conflict or right. are they so, just out of luck? We would do a conflict check in criminal court. Um, the way it works in our holistic office is that once the criminal court attorney picks up that person, whenever they flag the case for an endangering the welfare of a child, any sort of instance where they know there's a child involved, they'll make a referral to my family um, defense team, and then we will start advising the client immediately. If there's an order of protection in place, we will advise the client on how to go about getting the order of protection modified. In some instances where it slips through the crack and there's a final, or there's an order of protection that's not subject to family court modification, We'll do motion practice to try to move up the court date to have that modified as well. So the big question I have, a big question I have. But is I, I just want to say, you know, my office does the same thing, but that is not the case in Queens or Manhattan. 
where the agencies that do criminal work are separate from the agencies that do family work, right? So there is no direct nexus at all. And also the Legal Aid Society, which they, they represent the children in family court, and therefore usually there's a conflict in a case like this, and we, Bronx defendants, Brooklyn defendants would take that case. But um, normally, that no, it pure, does work pure. out. But you understand, and I know we've talked to you about this, we're not funded to do that work. So if, you know, the more cases there are, the harder it is for our offices to absorb so, that, that level of like work between before family court so cases. If so if you're an indigent defendant in Queens, you're either getting legal aid or you're getting Queens Law Associates. Right. And, and what you're saying is neither institution is set up to have to handle taking that defendant's order of protection and going into family right. court. Because the Center for Family Representation works in family court there, mm -hmm. not, not QLA. And I would just also add that to your point about if there is a conflict, well, when there is a conflict in that person, we are, we're unable to help that person. So effectively, they're unable to see their child. Right. Well, they'll, they'll get an 18B lawyer, but an 18B lawyer is just an individual and they don't have that. If there is a family court case, then they would get an 18B lawyer. But if there is no family court case assigned, right. then they just have to, on their own, know how to navigate the family court system. No, but someone's representing them in the criminal case is what I'm saying. Right. Right. The and criminal that court attorney would, wouldn't necessarily tell them you need to go to family court and file for a visitation petition and I'm going to represent you in Because that person's not an institutional provider, they're just right. one person. Right, right. And also we advise people, but we, can't, we cannot go with every person to file a visitation petition with them. Right. We just don't have the resources so to do that. How often um, are, are these orders of protection um, issued on the basis of a endangering the welfare of a child charge that does not actually involve a parent directing bad conduct towards the child. So. What do you think? Every case where a child is present during the arrest, in my opinion, uh, endangering the welfare of, of a child. In your experience. Yes. Well, I think if the, if the, the wrong conduct happened, I think we have to just remember there are arrests that happen that never see family court, but there are lots of cases where a child might be present, but it really conduct had nothing to do with what happened in the house that day. So for example, if they go in the home and there's a lot of drugs there, yes, they're gonna charge endangering the welfare. But you know, if there's no drugs there that day, or I don't know if they went to, somebody had a, a I'm gonna say a parole violation or something like that, and they just went to arrest them, they wouldn't necessarily take the child. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that, you know, that's, yeah, they wouldn't charge endangering the welfare. But so any case where endangering is charged, any time that, I, I mean, any time that the, the events that give rise to the arrest are happening in the presence of the child, mm -hmm. any time that happens, including domestic violence, they will charge endangering. Yeah. And, and in your view, is that an improper charge in most cases because the parent is not an actually endangering the welfare of the child, the child is just, just present. Not that there certainly can't be some kind of conduct that Correct. the mere presence of the child would put them in danger, but. If, if this gives you any idea of what I think about that, while we, would think, while we were talking about it earlier and the officers were reading out the elements, my note was, I think we should challenge the constitutionality of that statute. I mean, that's what I think of it. I mean, it's really overbroad. I mean, it's, it's insane. I mean, the morality of a child. I mean, what does that even mean? I and would yes. just also add that where there is an endangering in the welfare of a child, oftentimes when it's not directly connected to whatever the incident was, when ACS pleads that case, oftentimes what they're pleading is the fact that the parent was arrested and there was no one there to take, take care of the child. Mm -hmm. And so that, in fact, was endangerment of the child. They plead that in family court. Right, that's true, too. And also, like what happened with Jasmine Headley. When we told you to give up the child, you didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's endangering the welfare. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that happens, too. That's what I have, thank you. Thank you all for coming on and testifying. Thank you. All right, we're gonna call the last panel today, uh, Diane, uh, D Diana King, uh, Drug Policy Alliance, Allison, Holly, Holland? Oh, oh, Holland, to correct me. New York uh, Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, and Tanya Krupat, Osborne Association. Allison, New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, Diana King, DPA, Sonia, 
Osborne Association. And if there's anyone else who wishes to testify, please sign up with the Sergeant at Arms now. And we're going to ask you to get specific because we have to be out this room for it, the next hearing that's happening. Um, so if you can start, give us your recommendations. That would be great. All righty. Uh, you'll press the button and you may begin. You'll identify yourself for the record, who you're representing, and then you may begin. Okay. My name is Deanna King. I'm the policy manager with the Drug Policy Alliance. I realize I printed these incorrectly, so I will email them to you when I am done. Um, I support the spirit of the legislation and what the council is attempting to do, minimizing the harm of child arrest and the long-term harm of incarceration. Uh, but we do share the concerns of the defenders about the intervention of ACS um, and the way that this particular bill is structured that expedites that intervention prior to a parent being contacted. Um, so the policy that was laid out by the NYPD that we don't know if they're actually you know, following through with it, we don't have any data on that, it does delay that intervention to give parents an opportunity to contact a caregiver that could uh, take the place of them when, when they are uh, being arrested. And I understand your intent uh, was to prevent uh, a child from witnessing arrest in the first place, so you're coordinating with ACS and a partner organization to make sure that they're out of the house. Uh, but having that intervention so early in the process prior to a parent being made aware that this was gonna happen prevents them from having that dialogue uh, with the arresting officer or anyone um, to make sure that a caregiver is contacted. So we would like to see um, that particular structure of the proposal amended to reflect that the overall desire is to make sure that a child uh, is placed with someone who they view as a trusted adult um, and support the proposals of the defenders saying that they should partner with a partner organization, but the priority is to make sure that the parent uh, is given a uh, full agency to determine what is the best situation for that child. Uh, I also have a couple other recommendations uh, just about language access. Um, your proposal uh, mentions that an arresting officer um, should be able to communicate with the parent um, and the child about what is happening during that arrest, but it doesn't make any mention to the fact that not all people who are arrested are gonna be English speakers as a first language. Um, so to make sure that there's some coordination to know um, what the language of choice of that particular parent is and having a translator or an officer on hand who can uh, direct that and also for people who are disabled or deaf or blind or otherwise to make sure that a person can communicate to the child and the parent what is happening. Um, there's also the training protocol. Um, it's, training is also always recommended to the NYPD. It's hard to know how much that training is gonna stick. Uh, but we also just wanna make sure that the use of force in front of children is also uh, seen as priority. There's the, the matter of uh, children being, um, seeing their parent being handcuffed, but there's also the traumatizing effect of seeing a gun drawn. Um, and in the report that was referenced by the NYPD, they made mention of the fact that 30% of children who witness a parent being arrested also viewed a gun being drawn during that interaction. So that also needs to be made plainly clear in legislation um, that gun, that officers should be knowledgeable of a child being present, but also um, unless there is an imminent threat of danger, unless they have an awareness of weapons being in the facility, that they should withhold the use of uh, their weapons in that scenario so that children aren't witnessing that extreme form of violence. Um, the third thing I want to recommend is around the data collection. Um, it's hard for us to report on what the NYP doing because there's just not a lot of transparency around that. Um, so just being really clear about the number of children who are uh, referred to ACS as a matter of um, arrest to see that that intersection take place and what the outcomes are of that. If they're seeing, if they're being put in place of out of home care, if they're placed in foster care, to make sure that we have a really informed picture of what's happening to children and to just get some more clarity on, on, on the use of the policy as they have it written. Um, I know your intent is to codify this legislation to make the tacit proposal legal, um, but we do as advocates and as defenders need to be made aware of how it's actually being followed um, so we can make improvements and have some sort of uh, awareness of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so I will stop there and pass it to my colleague. Thank you for your testimony. 
Hi, thank you. I want to echo a lot of what was just said and what has been said this morning. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and really for the City Council's leadership in addressing the issues that Jasmine Hidley's horrific arrest brought to light. My name is Tanya Krupat, um, Director of the Osborne Center for Justice Across Generations with the Osborne Association. Since 2007, when Osborne launched the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, we've been deeply involved in leading efforts to safeguard children whose parents are involved with the justice system, including from the moment a parent is arrested. Our work focuses on arrests where the parent is not physically harming the child or not harming the child in any way, such as the arrest of Jasmine Headley. For more than a decade, we've been calling for efforts to safeguard children at the time of arrest to prevent the kind of trauma that Ms. Headley and her infant son have now experienced. And I'd just like to ask, you know, when the NYPD refers to things that they're already doing, thanks to the City Council, the patrol guide is now publicly available. That wasn't the case, and we have searched through it and have not found anywhere in the patrol guide the details that they mentioned. So we would love to know where it says a lot of the details that they said they're doing. Um, and then also, what is, what is the training? As you pointed out, um, really digging a little deeper. Who is doing it? What does it entail? The CIT tra training is a fantastic training, and as you asked, it's not, to our knowledge, inclusive of anything related to children. So great training, fantastic, and we need a training related to children at the time of arrest, as, as you're calling for. And we've worked with the Albany Police Department, and he, the ch former chief, Brendan Cox, when we met with him, said the same thing in YPD, saying, oh yeah, we do that. But the difference is when we asked him, is it written down, do you train on it, do you collect data on it, he realized, you know what, no. We don't, so it's not okay for me to say we're doing it when we don't do any of those three things to guarantee and you know, assure we're doing it. So just to bring that in. Our sense of urgency here is informed by the very first right of the Children of Incarcerated Parents Bill of Rights, which we included with our testimony, which is the I have the right to be kept safe and informed at the time of my parents' arrest. Created in 2005 in partnership with young people whose parents had been arrested and incarcerated, these eight rights provide us with a roadmap for reform. Since the voices of children and young people are often absent for our decisions around what is needed, I want to take a minute to read you the other seven rights. I have the right to be heard when decisions are made about me. I have the right to be considered when decisions are made about my parent. I have the right to be well cared for in my parent's absence. I have the right to speak with, see, and touch my parent. I have the right to support as I face my parent's incarceration. I have the right not to be judged, blamed, or labeled because my parent is incarcerated. I have the right to a lifelong relationship with my parent. Um, sorry. Um, we've heard directly from children who are in our programs about how they were devastated and scarred by witnessing their parents' arrest. I also used to work in a women's prison when the children would actually sometimes play out and enact the arrest scenarios. So it, children are deeply um, impacted, though NYPD may not see that. Um, it, can scar them and affect them for years. Um, as I mentioned, the Albany Police Department recognized several years ago that it's not only in children's best interest to do this, but actually in law enforcement's best interest to do that. Children who witness their parent be arrested do not have the best association with law enforcement, and many parents who have been arrested themselves worry that their children would not seek the assistance of police should they be um, in a situation and the Albany Police Department included winning back a generation as part of the reason they embraced um, a child sensitive arrest protocol. So the good news is there are actually very concrete models that the NYPD could embrace and in our testimony we attach a lot of examples. There's the International Association of Chiefs of Police model protocol, the Albany Police Department's protocol, there's data from the Criminal Justice Agency pointing to the fact that more than 70,000 children have experienced the arrest of a caregiver who provided some kind of financial support to them. And Strategies for Youth is another um, excellent organization that has a lot of resources. So like others have said, we support Intro 1349 with some amendments and revisions. And as others have said, m most broadly, um, not defaulting or over-involving ACS. We also advise that whenever possible and in all warrant situations, information about children be shared in advance of the arrest so that necessary steps can be taken to minimize trauma to children. Finally, we hope that the City Council will consider funding existing children and family serving programs or organizations that specialize in children's mental health and trauma to be available to NYPD and to children and families after an arrest. 
We cannot wait any longer to take action. We owe it to New York City's children, to Ms. Headley, her infant son, and to arresting officers who deserve the best guidance possible to address this absence of protocol and implementation now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for focusing on this uh, largely invisible issue. This conversation is long overdue. My name is Allison Hollihan, and I'm the Senior Policy Manager for the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, and I like to address Intro 806 and the broader need for the city to address and safeguard children whose parents are involved in the criminal legal system from the point of arrest through reentry. Since 2007, Osborne has been coordinating the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, which is a statewide collaborative of over 60 different government agencies, community and faith-based organizations, and those directly impacted by arrests of a parent and their subsequent incarceration. We already know a lot about what agencies can do better to support children of incarcerated parents, and we know that there is a great need for practices and policies to be put into place and for cross-systems collaboration to be examined and implemented. We coordinated the first ever statewide summit in 2010 to examine the needs and experiences of New York State's children with incarcerated parents, leading to the issuing of a report which we provided concrete recommendations, um, which we have submitted along with this testimony. While some of the report's comprehensive 80 sec rec 87 recommendations have been implemented, most remain pertinent and needed today. They include recommendations for law enforcement, criminal justice agencies, and children serving agencies. In 2016, we issued a report specifically for ACS and child welfare, outlining recommendations needed within this field and specifically for children in foster care. We also regularly provide training for the New York City Department of Education and Family Court and work with DOHMH to address the needs of children of incarcerated parents as well. We've tried to get this issue heard on the mayor's New York City's children cabinet, but was unsu were unsuccessful. While we have extensive experience convening diverse professionals to examine the needs of children whose parents are involved in the justice system, and many accomplishments, excuse me, accomplishments to share. Our efforts are small compared to the need. We are only two people. And there is no question there remains a need for leadership at the city level and coordinated action to safeguard children. For this reason, we applaud the intention behind Council Member Williams and Levin's introduction of Intro 806. However, we are concerned that placing leadership of this effort within the Department of Correction is hugely problematic and that this approach is both premature and could actually delay needed progress on this important issue. We advocate that DOE, Department of Health and Mental Health, Hygiene, and DHS be at the table, and most importantly, that families who have experienced the arrest of a parent be at the table and part of this discussion. We ask you to consider that before creating a task force, or at least concurrent with a task force, that City Council could pass a resolution or bill enacting the Children of Incarcerated Parents Bill of Rights that my colleague, Ms. Krupat, has just mentioned. This was actually proposed back in 2011 by Council Member Rodriguez. This would, require city, and this would also require city agencies to inventory their existing policies and practices and revise or create policies to safeguard children consistent with this Bill of Rights. Other jurisdictions have done this. San Francisco provides an example of taking this step. City Council could provide funding to support, enhance, and expand the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents to have the capacity to provide training and technical assistance to help agencies do the necessary work to comply with the Bill of Rights. After the above interactions are underway, uh, Intra 806 could be enacted with the, some revisions. A task force would be very important to monitor progress and facilitate cross-systems collaboration and coordination. The task force should be headed by an agency and person with knowledge of the special medical, mental health, educational, and other needs of children and families. And finally, we want to express our concern around the effectiveness of city task forces to act with the urgency and yield concrete results. While we think that such task forces are a valuable idea with the potential to be very effective, we also look at the re recently passed CARE Act. 
the Compassion and Assistance for Returning Elders Act. Mayor de Blasio signed the CARE Act into effect on January 2018, thanks to a bill sponsored by Councilmember Drum to create a citywide interagency task force examining the needs of older people returning from incarceration. 14 months later, the task force has not been formed and has never met. NYSEP, the New York Initiative for St Children of Incarcerated Parents stands ready and eager to work with City Council to make significant progress to safeguard children. It is long past time to address the fact that we do not know how many children in foster care have an incarcerated parent, nor do we know how many children are present at a parent's arrest. It was only recently that we learned that almost over 36,000 high school students in New York City have reported that they have experienced the incarceration of a parent. Those are huge numbers. But we don't know how many children in middle school or elementary schools have experienced this. We know anecdotally that it's very, very, very many children. It is not okay that we do not know that thousands of children are feeling isolated, alone, and stigmatized because their parents arrest or incarceration. It is not okay that we know that many children who want to visit their parents cannot do so due to lack of resources, lack of programs to bring them to visits, and truly visiting policies at our city jails that just aren't child friendly and can be quite traumatizing to children. There is too much that has become unacceptable and normal that should absolutely should not be. I've included many resources with the testimony and hope that these will be considered as the council decides a path forward. Please note that the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents has quarterly meetings, and we invite you or your staff to attend such meetings. The next one is Friday, March 8th, from 10 to 12. Uh, I can give you location and details. Yeah, you request. can give that thank to you. us. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, this is a very good hearing, and thank you for uh, recommendations on other bills for all the advocates who came out who do this work day in and day out. Uh, we really depend on you to also uh, help to guide us. Uh, to make things better. Um, so we really appreciate you coming out. With that being said, this hearing, unless you have any closing remarks. Nope. All right, I want to thank, thank all of our staffs. I want to thank the Public Safety uh, Committee's Council, Dan Uattis, uh, Casey Addison, uh, Nevin Singh. Thank you for all your work. And to my Legislative Director, Jordan Gibbons, this hearing is now closed.